Terrific. This is um, the second half of the talk that we did two weeks ago. And I'm assuming that all of you have the handout. Do you have this handout? This is the one. Okay, I see Sheikh, you're putting your thumbs up. Okay, terrific. So you've sent it to your group. And I want to say welcome to all the people from Sheikh Salim's group. Uh, this is These are a group of businessmen and leaders who were in a Zoom webinar with us a week ago and who have joined us rather late. So in some ways, you're miss, you've missed quite a few of the lectures that we've already done. Nonetheless, uh, welcome uh, on board. It's great to have you. We're going to go ahead and review this lecture, and it's called In Search of the Man. This is the historical critique concerning who Muhammad was, how Islam began, and the difficulties that we're, well, actually, the difficulties that Islam is having concerning how Islam really began. So this is a critical assessment. This is a historical critical assessment, uh, not a internal assessment. Uh, we're assuming that there are problems with the emergence. So some of you, this will be new. Others of you, you will have heard some of this before. And uh, for those of us who have already been on this course uh, every week or every other week, you will already know the first half. So we'll, con we'll go ahead and get you all up to speed so we're all on the same page. But before we begin, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this chance uh, we, during this lockdown to be able to come together, uh, people from all over India and uh, from other parts of the world as well. We want to thank you, Lord, that we can critically analyze Islam using historical criticism, the same kind of criticism that was applied against our book and you as well. And so, Lord, as we unpack it today and we look at this new material that's coming in, we ask, Lord, that we'll be able to use it in our own talks with Muslims and also in our own ministry. We put everything into your hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So let's go ahead and let's, and, and if you have your handout in front of you, follow with me. It's, I know it's, a, it's many pages. Maybe may, many of you may have not wanted. It's 27 pages. We will be going through the handout to begin with, and then I will jump into the PowerPoint, which I will share with you so you'll have it on your screen and we'll follow because the most exciting material is yet to come. Now, let's go ahead and ask, what, why is it we're even asking this question? Well, the, the answer, simple answer is very, is, uh, is that much of everything we've known about Islam is from material that has supposedly been with us for 1400 years, at least that's what we've been told, and that's what you have all been told, and that's what you're brought up with. That's the only narrative that's out there. There is really only one, one story that you're taught in all your schools, in all your universities, in our Bible schools, in our seminaries. We're always taught that there is really only one history, and that's the history from the Islamic traditions. So the assumption is, right off the bat, and I'm sure this is the assumption you're, you have all come with, is that Islam is a religion that's been around for 1,400 years, since the mid-7th century, since Muhammad, born in 570, died in 632 AD, since he was the one that, was, that, uh, that introduced it. Now, Muslims, I know, Muslims will say, whenever we bring this up, that Islam has always been. Sheikh, you know this, when as a Muslim, you're a former Muslim, you will... People from uh, Islam will always say, no, Adam was a Muslim, Abraham was a Muslim, David was a Muslim, all the prophets were Muslim, Jesus was a Muslim. The, but as far as from a historical standpoint, and as far as from an academic standpoint, the assumption is that Islam began with Muhammad. And we're going to start with that assumption because that's the assumption you're going to hear on the streets. That's the assumption that is coming through you from all of your teaching. And also, that's the only thing that you're really permitted to start with. So let's start with that assumption that Islam began in 1400, uh, 1400 years ago in the sixth, well, so really the seventh century, starting at 610 when the revelation was, start, uh, was begun to be revealed between 610 and 632. Now, if that is the case, then everything that we know about Islam must come from two sources. And the two sources are the book, the Quran, this book right here, the Quran, and what this book is about. And of course, this book is about God, Allah, but also about his prophet Muhammad. So this is the book that is the foundation for everything that Islam believes, for all the, for what everything that Muslims believe, I should say, all modeled on the man Muhammad. 
again, what we're saying there, therefore, is that Islam is dependent on those two foundations. It's dependent on those two pillars, the book and the man, the book and the man, the book and the man, as are we not on those two pillars, but we are also dependent as Christians on another book and another man, this book here, the Bible. Which is the bigger book? Well, as you can see, I keep my Bible bigger for a reason, so you always know which is the bigger book. This is our foundation, and this book is about another man, a much bigger man, a much better man, a man who can enter time and space, unlike that man that is in the Quran. And so we are also we are fr we are also dependent on a book and a man. So we come from the same paradigm, both along with Islam. So because of that, our, we're able to understand them so much better. We're able to understand Islam so much better because we start from that same paradigm. Now, here's the problem, and this is what we're really going to get in today. If this is the book that founds, it is the foundation for all of Islam, modeled by a man who is, a, who is the model and the paradigm for all of Islam, then when did that man, when was that man born, and what do we know about that man? And so to understand that, we need to go back to his Basically, he is the skeletal of his life. So if you have your hand out there, let's go through it. It should be on the first page there. Look at the first page. What we know, and this is what we've been taught, and this is what all of you have been taught. I don't know of it. If you have another narrative, let me know. But I've not come across any other narrative but this. And that is that Muhammad was born in 570, that he was, in, uh, he was living in Mecca. He grew up in Mecca in 610 AD. He was out in the Hira cave. Uh, where he was meditating, and suddenly the angel Gabriel appears to him and says, Ikra, which means to recite or to read, and his response was, Ma Ikra, I cannot recite, I cannot read. He was squeezed, and this happens three times. Finally, the angel lets him go. He returns back to his wife, Khadija, who is there in Mecca, and then repeats the story to her. She tests him by having him sit on either one of her legs and then disrobing, and she realizes that this, is, this was an angel because an angel would not appear to her if she was disrobed. She then introduces him to her cousin, Ibn Waraka Ibn Nofal, and he then is the one that's, that underlines and stipulates that truly Muhammad is a prophet. He was an Astorian Christian, one of the ironies of history. That happens in 610. So from that time on, from 610 up till 622, he receives these revelations, known as the Meccan Surahs. When you look at the Quran, they are basically everything that's in the second part, this part. This is the first half. This is the second half. It goes backwards, I know. So it's everything that happens in the second half is the Meccan Surahs. All right. So he receives those from 610 to 622. In 621, he's woken up in the middle of the night, is told to get on the back of the winged horse called the Burak, and he flies from Mecca up to, up to Jerusalem. And from there, he ascends the seven heavens to meet with Allah and receives 50 prayers, comes back to the fifth heaven, meets Moses, who tells him to bring it down, and so he whittles it down back and forth between the seventh and the fifth heaven, from 50 to 45, down to five prayers. Whereupon uh, Moses says, good, that's enough. Now you can go back down to earth, which he does. He comes back to earth with these five prayers. The morning, the afternoon, before sundown, after sundown, and before they go to bed. Three in the evening, one in the afternoon, one in the morning. So five prayers, that is the mitaj, and that's the event that happens in 621. In 622, then, he moves from Mecca up to Medina with about 80, some people say maybe as many as 200 of his followers, and he moves to Medina, and he tries to arbitrate between the Ansar, who are the natives there of Medina, and the Jews, the Bani Kainuka family, the Banu Nadir family, the Banu Kuraisa family, the three major Jewish family. He tries to arbitrate between them because they're having this bad blood. It doesn't work. Within two years, that breaks down. He puts together the Treaty of Medina. The three tribes do not sign that treaty. As you can see, when you look at the document, their names are not there. And so he decides to, and he gets a vision from God to redirect the Qibla, that means the direction of prayer, from Jerusalem back down to Mecca. That happens in 624. So in 624, he has a rupture with the Jews. He has a new Qibla. It is now in Mecca. And then the, the new revelations from 624, or actually started from 622, begin to appear. These are the first part of the Quran, this part of the Quran here. So everything from here to about halfway through would be the Medinan. This would be Mecca. This would be Medinan. My Quran goes from left to right because... Uh, from right to left, excuse me, because it's in Arabic and in English. So it's backwards. Nonetheless, it's fascinating 
once he has this rupture with the Jews, he then confronts the Jews, attacks them, and you can read the story, what happens there between 622 and 632, that last uh, 10 years of his life and his ministry, he comes back to Mecca, conquers Mecca in 630 without firing a shot, and then dies in 632, some believe by poisoning. Abu Bakr takes over for two years from 632 to 634. He dies normally. Umar then takes over from 634 to 644. He is killed. Uthman then takes power from 644 to 656. He is killed. And then Ali, the adopted son of Muhammad, takes over from 656 to 661, the last five years. And he is killed. Now, th that period from 624 to 661 is known as the Rashidun period. That is the known as the rightly guided caliphs. Now, all that that I have just told you, everything that I have just told you in the last what, five to 10 minutes, the whole history of Muhammad when he was born, when he uh, living in Mecca, moving up to Medina, having problem with the Jews, uh, uh, conquering Mecca, dying in 632, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali all coming after him, that roughly, well, from really from 610 up to, to 661, so about that 50-year period. Everything you've heard, you mean just saying, the last 10 minutes, where does it come from? And most of you probably haven't really asked that question, because I don't hear Muslims asking that question as well. Everything I've just said, the history of Muhammad, the history of how Islam began, it does not come at all from the time Muhammad lived. None of it comes from the time of Muhammad's life. Now, fascinating. No one's asked this question. I don't hear anybody asking this question. So when was it written down? When is everything, and if you look at the bottom of page one, you see that timeline I have there. So everything you see here in the red, this part here, that's the period we're talking about, all right? That period right there. So everything you see here, was not written here. It all gets written down here. Look at the names. Ibn Ishaq is the first to write down the biography of Muhammad. Look at the dates for Ibn Ishaq. He died in 765. Muhammad died in 632. So you can see already there's a problem there. And that's why we need to be careful as we're going through this. We need to look and see what is it that we're talking about because everything we know about this man Muhammad, everything that I've just told you does not come from his lifetime. It does not come from his even his own century. It is first written down by a man named Ibn Ishaq who died in 765. But we don't have anything of Ibn Ishaq. We have nothing today from him. We're dependent on another man named Ibn Isham. You can see his name right there. Ibn Isham dies in 833. So that is the ninth century. So all we have concerning who Muhammad was, what he did, what he said, how Islam began, how the Quran was put together comes from that period, 833. So that is the ninth century for what is happening in the seventh century. And that's the problem. Now, what about his sayings? Because those are even more, more prolific. Those are much uh, larger in size. The sayings of Muhammad, one known as the Hadith of Muhammad. The biography of Muhammad is the Siddha of Muhammad. Now we're talking about the sayings. Well, the first to write them down, the first to compile these sayings down, is a man named Al-Buhari. He dies in 870. So we're talking about 240 years later. That's an awful lot of years. That's over two centuries, two and a half centuries early, later. Then we get to, now there's others that come after him. There's Sahih Muslim, there's Ibn Daud, there's Tirmidhi. These all come after uh, Sahih Buhari, Al-Buhari. So you can see why we're talking about much, much, much later, 240 years later. Then we get to the Tafsir, which would be the commentaries that explain this book, the Quran. Those don't get written down till Al-Tabari is the first to write it down. He dies in 923, so that's the 10th century. 9th and 10th century for the Siddha, for the Hadith, for the Tafsir, and then we have the fourth genre, which would be the Tahrik. And the Tahrik was written, also starred by Al-Tabari. Others that write after him, Zamakshari, Suyuti, Baidawi, others that write the Tafsir after him and the Tahrik after him, but not before him. And they're all post-10th century. So basically what I'm saying is everything we know about Muhammad, about Mecca, about Islam, about the Muslims, about the, the, how the Quran was put together, everything we know about how Islam began historically, 
comes from two to 300 years later. Does that bother any of you? It should bother all of you. Why? Turn the page. Let's look at, let's look at Christianity. When you look at Christianity, you will see that Christianity also has a book of the man, as I said earlier, and yet it's dependent on the person of Jesus Christ, who was a historical figure. We do know that he was born in Bethlehem. We do know that he died in Jerusalem. So we know the man has a historical record, and that's why we have to ask the same historical questions of Jesus that we are asking of Muhammad, and we have to ask the same questions about the beginning of Christianity as we're asking of Islam. And when you look at the biography of Jesus, the Siddha of Jesus, who is the first to write it down? Well, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel writers. They write down his story, especially the last three years of his ministry. We know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were writing within, within 40 years of Christ's death, they had written down their biographies. John would have written much later. He wrote about 60 years of, within Christ's death. But we know two of the biographers were eyewitnesses to what they were writing. John and Matthew were actually there. They were with Jesus the last three years. John was at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. Jesus spoke to him from the cross. So we know that two of the biographies of Jesus were written by eyewitnesses, and the other two were written by those who get, got it from the eyewitness. And all of the biographies, all of the Siddha of Jesus would have been written within 60 years of Christ's death. That means while the disciples, while the eyewitnesses were still alive, hugely important. As far as the sayings of Jesus, the Hadith of Jesus, well, that's the, the same people that wrote the Siddha also wrote the Hadith. If you look on your Bible, some of you have red letter whenever Jesus spoke. That's the Hadith of Jesus. They were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as well, all within 60 years of Christ's death. What about the Tafsir of Jesus, the commentaries? Well, that would be the letters of Paul. Paul was the one who commented on what Jesus said, writing letter after letter to Ephesus, to Philippi, to Corinth. So the Tafsir of Jesus, Paul's letters, would have been started to be written down within 15 years of Jesus' death. He died in 62 AD, so between 15 years and uh, 60, uh, 62 AD, that's within 15 to 40 years of Christ's death, we already have the Tafsir written down. And then the Tahrit, the histories, well, that would be the book of Acts. There's the equivalent in the book of Acts. And that was written between 52 AD and 62 AD, so you have that Within 40, uh, sorry, th within 30 to 40 years, you have the Tahrik written down. So we have the Sira, the Hadith, the Tafsir, and the Tahrik of Jesus, all written within 60 years of Christ's death. Written, much of them, by people who actually knew Jesus, who actually saw him, who actually saw what they were writing and heard what they were hearing. So if you do a comparison between Islam and Christianity, everything we know about Jesus, what he said, did, and, uh, what, and what is happening in his lifetime, was within 15 to 60 years of his death. Everything we know about Muhammad and the creation of Islam is within 200 years to 300 years of his death. Which is more authoritative? Ooh, I love that. Because that shows me that what we're dealing with and what we're, uh, what we're dependent on to know about our creation of, is, of Christianity, about the emergence of Christianity, is much stronger than anything Islam can come with. In fact, if we were dependent on Jesus and what we know about him, about what he said, as Islam is dependent on Muhammad and how Islam began, we would know nothing about Jesus until the third century. How would we defend him? How would I defend him in debate? I would be able to defend him, not historically. That's why it's important that we ask this question, and that's why we're asking the question today. Now let's continue on. When you go down through the, the, the problems that this brings up the scholars, obviously are having a very difficult time with this, because this, for the scholars, this suggests that everything that Ibn Hisham, Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Tar al tabari all of them who wrote all this material down, everything they were dependent on was based on oral tradition. And oral tradition, by definition, is hugely irresponsible. You, can, you know you can see what oral tradition does. You can manipulate it. You can accrete it. You can delete it. You can control it. You can do everything you want with it. You can corrupt it because of the problem that you're just, it's nothing more than passing on from word to mouth. You've done this probably in birthday parties called Chinese whispers, uh, where people will tell, one person will tell someone in their ear, they will tell the next person, that will, they will tell the next person. And by the time it gets down to about 30 pe people, uh, 15 minutes later, what the first person said and what the last person said is probably two different things. It's a great 
little skit to do when you're at a birthday party. If that can be changed within 15 minutes, can you see what would happen over two to 300 years, how it can be manipulated and changed and accreted and deleted? That's why we don't trust oral tradition. We don't trust the Islamic traditions as, well, as a result. And that's why the, co the concern of the scholars is, why did it take so long to write it down? Why did they write it down immediately? Could no one read and write at that time? Please remember, by the time that Abdul Malik comes to power, or let's put it even before that, by the time Mu'awiyah comes to power in 661, they had already controlled all the way from Tripoli in West Africa, all the way over to India or Afghanistan in the East. All that swath of land was under their control. Are you telling me that no one could read and write in any of those countries? Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, all these great five cities, the Levant, were under Islamic control within 10 years of Muhammad's death. No one could read and write in those cities. By the time Abdul Malik comes into power, all the way from Spain to India, all that land was under their control. And you're telling me that nobody could read and write in all that, in all that area from Spain to India? Certainly people could read and write. And this is why the scholars are asking, why did it take so long? If they could read and write, why didn't they write down his biography? Why didn't they write down his sayings? Why does we have to wait two to 300 years? More than that, if it is all written down, should we trust it? Should we trust it? And the answer is absolutely not. So what should we do? Well, we need to go back to the seventh century. We need to go back to the time period. This was all taking place. We need to go back to the same century that Muhammad lived, purported to have lived. And we need to ask, therefore, what was actually happening then? Now, if you look at the map at the bottom of page two, you will see the swath of how much land we're talking about. Here's a map. The brown area and the orange area and the pink area is where Islam now was under control, had now control. And you can see that was an enormous amount of land. Let's turn to page three. Now, the people that I'm going to use and the ones that I have said two weeks ago, the ones that I'm going to use primarily from what I'm going to be speaking about today are listed there on page three. I'm going to be using Dr. John Wandsborough, who is head of department at School of Oriental African Studies uh, there in University of London. He is the one that came out with the first real, um, well, he's not the first, maybe, but he was the most popular well, uh, critique that we call revisionism. Uh, he was the first to really introduce revisionism. And he came out with this in uh, 1977, 1978, two books called Quranic Studies and Sectarian Milieu. Those were both in the 1970s. Dr. Gerald Haunting was my professor uh, when I was studying there at the University of London back in the 1990s. Uh, he was the one that really introduced me to all this material. So I've been working with this material for 25 years. This is not new to me. This is old hat, what I'm teaching you today. This is all stuff that I have gone through for the last 25 years. And it's the material that I'm working on the most right now. This is where my bread and butter is. This is my signature piece. This is where I love this kind of material. Uh, Dr. Haunting was the one that introduced it to me when I was there at, uh, at School of Orange and African Studies. I would take what he was teaching me down to Speaker's Corner every Sunday afternoon, and I got beat up and I got knocked unconscious there at Speaker's Corner by the Muslims because they had never heard this kind of material before. For them, it was brand new. And the police were so concerned for my health that they asked me to get up on a ladder in 1995. So from 1995 all the way till 2017, when I finally left London, I was on the ladder every Sunday, unpacking this material, testing it out, seeing how the Muslims reacted. And sometimes I'd have hundreds of Muslims around my ladder and boy, they, they get angry. They did not like this material. And you can see why, as we continue going through it, you will see how damaging this is to Islam because this is a historical critique. Now, why is that important and why is that different? A historical critique is neutral. That's the first thing you need to know. It is absolutely neutral. Anybody can use this material. Anybody can understand this material. You don't have to be a Muslim to understand it. You don't. And this is not a Christian polemic. We're not Christians attacking Islam with this material. This is historical, which means it is academic. More than that, you cannot be called a harass, uh, a hate preacher. I cannot be called an Islamophobe for using this kind of material because the questions I'm asking are neutral. These are historical questions. I'm asking simply, who is this man? Where did he live? What was he doing? What was he saying? And in what time period? That's it. That's the historical critique. The book, the man, the place, and the event. We're looking at the time period that all these took place. 
which means anybody can ask this. You can be a humanist, you can be an atheist, you can be a Hindu, you can be anybody, and you need to ask this question of every revelation and of every person. So we need to ask this question of the Upanishads. We need to ask this question of the Bhagavad Gita, of the Vedas there for the Hindus, of the Granth Sahib for the Sikhs. We need to ask this, continue to ask this, because we are the ones that know it the best because it's been asked of Christianity and the Bible for over 200 years. We are the only ones that understand it better than anybody else as Christians because it's been part of our own history. Historical criticism is basically biblical criticism. It was started on this book. It was created with this book. Redacted criticism, which I'm going to use today. Source criticism, which I'm going to use today. All these criticisms came about by asking these questions of the Bible. And the Bible has passed every one of their tests. Love it. Now, I can see, for those of you, you may start getting questions as I'm going through this material. There is a chat button at the bottom of the screen. Open the chat button and start writing your questions. At the end of this talk, I will answer your questions. And if you're, I cannot do it live. I mean, I cannot have you speak to me because there's so many of us. There's over 50 of us on line right now, it would be cacophony if all of you were speaking at once. So if you could write your questions as we're going through, I will then go ahead and answer those questions at the end of the hour and a half. So let's continue on. So we have also Dr. Patricia Corona. Now, Dr. Patricia Corona is one of my favorites. She is from Denmark. She read and she could read and write 15 languages. She was way ahead of the rest of the world. And because of that, she was dangerous for Islam. And she was writing material there in Oxford University, head of department at Oxford University, when she wrote Mech and Trade in the Rise of Islam in 1987. Because of that, she got death threats from Muslims there in England. And she had to move from Oxford to Cambridge. That's where I got to know her. Uh, when I started my doctorate, she was my supervisor, my second supervisor. And it was she that actually gave me all my material for my first debate against Dr. Jamal Badawi in 1995, my first debate at Cambridge University. Cambridge University was the first place that this debate had done. That was 1995, 25 years ago. And I gave 10 historical challenges, all of which we're going to talk about today. They're all still in there. That was in 1995 to Dr. Jamal Badawi, considered at that time to be the world authority on the Quran in the English language. And he couldn't even answer one. He had never heard this material before. This was all new to him, absolutely new to him. So that happened in 1995. You can then see why. I am so excited by this material. So that was Dr. Patricia Crone. Dr. Andrew Rippon uh, from Calgary University, he has just passed away, so has Patricia Crone. She passed away a little over a year ago. He was the one that took this very difficult academic material and put it into layman's terminology so all of us can understand it. Dr. Robert Hoyland was another friend of mine. I knew him when he was at Oxford University. He um, read and he could read and write 18 languages. These people are linguists. They're amazing, amazing minds, and yet they're way ahead of everybody else, and that's why they're so dangerous. Dr. Yehuda Neva out of University of Jerusalem wrote Crossroads to Islam, and he is the world authority on the earliest Arabic inscriptions. He was went into the desert and read these inscriptions and interpreted them for today. And then the, in the German school, you have Dr. Uh, Gunther Luling, Dr. Gerd Prynne, Dr. von Volkmer, and Dr. Oleg. They are all from Germany. They are the ones who did the, have done the best work on the Quran itself. Uh, and now it's these are these scholars, the top in the world, who I'll be using in my talk today. But I also want to introduce two laymen who have also been, I think, probably been more pivotal than any of the scholars, but they're scholars in their own right. This is iced tea. This is not beer, just for any of you who know, who have a question. We like iced tea like this in, in, in America. I know you hate it in India, so please don't follow my lead. Three new books and two new documentaries that I'd like to introduce, and they're on page three and four if you open up your handout. The one book that I'd like to introduce is by Dr. Tom Holland, and it's called In the Shadow of the Sword. Dr. Tom Holland took all this material, that, and I was one that introduced it to him back in 19, uh, 2006. He took six years to write his book, came out with it in 2012, where he took all this historical, these historical problems, put it into one book, but he was very careful not to come to any conclusions. Very careful not to come to any conclusions. And that's why, though the book is amazing, it doesn't want to come to conclusions because he doesn't want to step on Muslim stoves. He was being very politically correct, you might say. He put it into a documentary uh, 
Islam, the Untold Story, which you can get on YouTube. I hope you can get it in India. I know we can get it here in the United States. You can go and see if it's up on YouTube. It's only a 90 minutes long. I would encourage after this talk today, every one of you go up and watch that documentary. It's called Islam, the Untold Story. It takes everything that he talked about in his book, and he was very careful not to come to conclusions at, at that time, but just to raise up all the questions. Now, that was only shown one time on Channel 4 on August 28, 2012. They wanted to show it a second time later on that fall, but because there was such an outrage uh, from the Muslims there in Britain, they never showed it a second time, which is unfortunate. And that's why you need to go up on YouTube to find it. But the man that I'm going to really introduce is this man right here. This is Dan Gibson. Dan Gibson has probably done the most pivotal research on in situ. He has actually gone to the areas that he's talking about. He's lived amongst the Bedouin, learned their languages, and for 25 years, from 1979 to 2004, he studied mosques. He studied all the earliest geography of Islam. He was there amongst the Bedouins. He was living amongst them, learned their languages, and he went from mosque to mosque in over 100 mosques. He is the first one in the history of Islam to have done this. And he measured where they were directed. He measured their qiblas, the direction of prayer, in all these mosques. And so I'm going to be looking at his material specifically today because of how pivotal that is to where we're going. Now, looking on page four, I'll be, you'll, I'm going to go and give you their fi findings. I'm going to tell you their conclusions. Let's look at their conclusions before I prove them. Let's go and see what they concluded. Number one, the first Arab inscription in referencing Muhammad is not written until 691. We have no reference to the man named Muhammad from within any Arab sources. You notice I'm using the word Arab. I'm not saying Muslim sources. From any Arab sources prior to 691. Two, the first reference to people called Muslims. That's why I didn't call them Arabs. We don't have any reference to this pe these people called Muslims until the 690s. So what did these people call themselves? Because they were conquering Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo. What did they call themselves? They called themselves Hagarines. That means in the line of Hagar. They called themselves Ishmaelites in the line of Ishmael. They called themselves Maghre. They were from the Maghreb. They called themselves Muhajuru. They call themselves Sarasin, Mahajuru, people of the Hijjah, people of the Exodus, <clears throat> nomads, people for movement who moved from one place to another. So these were nomads. These were people in the line of Hagar, in the line of Ishmael. That's what they call themselves. They never called themselves Muslims, nor did they refer to a religion called Islam. We don't see anything that comes too close to uh, the name Islam until after 691. We don't have any reference to the city that Muhammad lived in, Mecca, until 741. Ooh, two, 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 two. That's the mid 8th century. He died in the mid or the early 7th century. So for over a hundred years, we have nothing referring to him, his city, sorry, referring to his city, Mecca. We'll get into that. So, as I said two weeks ago, <clears throat> there are, when you open up the Quran, there are enormous problems with what we know as geography. There are well, nine places named, though there are 52 different geographical places, only nine of them are named, and they're repeated many, many, many times. In fact, we know that 23 times there is reference to these people from, from um, Ad, which would be the biblical Uz. 24 times these people from Thamud, who would be the biblical Nabataeans. And seven times these people from Midian, who are the Midianites. So we know about the people from Arad and Tamud and Nabati and, uh, and Midian. Those are people that are well uh, talked about, spoken about, revealed in the Bible itself. So they're, they're not foreign to us. What's fascinating is we know, therefore, where Ad, Tamud and Midian are. And they're, nothing, they're nowhere around uh, Mecca at all. They're nowhere in the Hejaz. They're nowhere in Arabia. They're much, much further north. They're 600 miles further north in what is today Jordan which is a problem in and of itself, because if this prophet who is referred to over and over again is having contact with these people almost on a daily basis, then how could he have contact with people that are 600 miles further north? Unless, of course, he had a helicopter, which they didn't have back in the 7th century. So that's the difficulty we're dealing with. The geographical locations just make no sense. There are 65 geographical references, nine places named. They are all 600 miles too far north in the wrong places. 
when you look at the gospel of news and do it, uh, the gospel of Luke in the New Testament and just do a comparison. In the gospel of Luke, there are 110 geographical places or references, 31 places named. They are all in the right place. They be all belong where they are uh, stipulated. And that's the difference when you look at the gospel of Luke and you just compare it with the Quran. What's more, when you look at the Quran, you will see over and over again, it refers to ideas. It refers to that this is the first settlement, the first sanctuary, point to mankind in Surah 396, that it's the mother of all settlements, according to Surah 6 and also Surah 42, that it's the place where Adam and Eve were sent down to, according to Surah 7. It's where Abraham lived. That's in 1900 BC. That's according to Surah 21. We know that it's also where Muhammad was born and where he lived and grew up. Uh, we also know is where the Qibla was when Rida was repositioned back in 624. That's in Surah 2. Yet in every case when we hear about this place, Mecca's name is not given. It's all inferred by the translators, by those who translated the Quran, to mean Mecca. And that's why they have to put it in parentheses. Mecca is only referred to once in the entire Quran. And that's in chapter 48, verse 24. You don't find Mecca anywhere else. Proving that there is a problem here. Why is it, if it's such a great city, if it's such an old city, if it's the oldest city in the history of mankind, if it's where Abraham lived in 1900 BC, if it was the center of trade, north, south, east, and west, then why is there no reference to it in any, any manuscript or any inscription? Why is it that even in the Quran, it's only mentioned once? Put that under your hat. Let's continue on. Page six. We're going through this very quickly because most of you have heard this. It's just the new ones who haven't. Look at the maps that I have on page six. Take a look at them. And these are trade maps that you have from the seventh century, the sixth and the seventh century. And you will notice when you look at the trade maps, take a look and see if you can find Mecca on them. There is no reference to Mecca on any of these maps. These two at the bottom are actually from the seventh century. Take a look on page seven. One, two, three, three, two other maps. These are both from the 7th century. Now, all the other cities are there. You can see Taif, you can see Yathrib, you can see Khaibar, you can see Tabuk, you can see Gaza, you can see Sana, Najran. You can see all these places on these maps, but you cannot find Mecca. The most important city, the one city that should be on all these maps, is not there. So when is the first time we see Mecca referred to on any map? Not till 900 AD. Not till the 10th century. We have no reference on any map of Mecca until the 10th century. Ooh, two, 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 two. You've got a problem with Mecca. And that's why we need to zero in on Mecca. From a historical standpoint, if Mecca is that significant, if it is where Adam and Eve were sent to, therefore the oldest settlement in the history of mankind, if it is where Abraham was living and working there in 1900 BC, it's hugely important to us as well, because I like to know if Abraham was living in Mecca. I thought he lived 600 miles further north in Palestine, not way down in Arabia. But according to Islam, he was there in Mecca. If that is the case, there should be some reference to Mecca. It should be on some maps. It's not. Now, what's more, we have the trade route theory introduced by Montgomery Watt. Dr. Montgomery Watt introduced this way back in the 1800s, and he talked about the fact, if you looked at the bottom page here, you can see it right here, that the... There were two great empires in the 7th century. You had the Byzantines and you had the Sassanids. The Byzantines were Christian. The Sassanids were, uh, where they were Persians, Zoroastrians. Byzantines were Christians. Sassanids or Sassanians were Zoroastrian. And they controlled that part of the world substantially. And so the trade normally would go from, all, coming from, from your side, from India, <clears throat> And China, even further west or further east, they'd be coming west. I, am I going west? I can't tell because everything's backwards now. I have to do everything backwards looking at you. So I'm assuming, just assume, if I'm wrong, then switch, help me switch. Let's just say India and, and uh, is the east. Is this the east, Sheikh? Is this the east and that's the west? Or is it this the east and that the west? That's the east. Okay, from looking from your standpoint. So over here is India and China, and this is where all the trade is coming from. It's got to get over to the Mediterranean. So look at the map down there. You can see, in order for it to get over to the Mediterranean, they couldn't go north because there you have the Hindu Kush and you have the Himalayas. So they had to come to the western coast of India, and they had to get a, go across the uh, 
what we know as the Arabian Sea over into the Persian Gulf. And you can see the, the black arrows here. They had to go across over here into the Persian Gulf, up through the Persian Gulf, then over across what is today Jordan and Syria over into the Mediterranean. And that was the trade. And it had been like that for centuries. But then the Sassanians and the Byzantines started warring against each other from the 5th century on. And as they warred, they then were shut down that trade. So as they shut down that trade, they had to redirect the trade. And what Montgomery Watt said is that trade then went to the south, went across the Arabian Sea, down here to Gaza, sorry, to Aden, to Aden here in the south, and went right across the desert all the way up to Gaza in the north. So it went from Aden to Najran to Sana to Taif, down to Mecca, then back up to Yathrib, then up to Khaybar, Tabuk, and then up to Gaza. That's what Montgomery Watt suggested back in the 1800s. That is known as the trade route theory. Now, Dr. Patricia Corona looked at that theory. We're now on page eight. And she noticed, if you see this map here at the top of page eight, she noticed that when you get up and you follow that trade route from Aden up to Gaza, from Aden up to Gaza, that it has to make a detour down to Mecca. It has to come off the Western Plateau, come down a thousand meters to get down to Mecca, and then go up a thousand meters to get back up to Yathra. And she said, oh, that's curious. Here, I'll just put it up closer to the, uh, those of you who have handouts, there it is. You can see there's a jog there. Can you see the jog right here? There's a jog right there down to Mecca. And she said, that doesn't make sense. And why would they be taking it up the Western Plateau when they have a waterway right here. See the waterway going up? The Dead Sea. Why wouldn't they just keep it on the board the ships? It would make sense since you're already on board ship coming from the west coast of India. You're coming across the Arabian Sea. Why would you take it off the ships there at Aden and go 1,250 miles by land when you have a waterway that you can use? It's much cheaper to go by ship. Even today it's cheaper, is it not? And she found that if you take a ton of goods just 50 miles by land, it would be the same price as 1,250 miles by sea. Ooh, choo, 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 choo. Why hadn't anybody noticed this before? Why had this Danish woman there at Oxford University noticed that something that no one else had noticed for 1,400 years? So she, because she was able to read and write all these languages, she went back and she went back and looked at all the documents from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, all the way up looking at all of them and reading them in their original text. They had not been translated. None of these documents have been translated, but she could read them. One of the few women in the world that could do that. And she noticed that there was no trade whatsoever that went across Arabia, that all the trade was maritime. What she noticed is what it came across here over to Aden, but it didn't stop at Aden. It then went up right up the waterway and it was not the Arabs that were in charge of trade. It was the Eritreans, the Africans from what is today Eritrea. Agilus is the city that came up over and over again in her documents. These, the Agilusians, the Eritreans, the Ethiopians, they were people of the seas. They were people that traded on the seas. Their names are all over the western coast of India. There are no Arab names in any of the documents. And the reason is very simple. The Arabs were not seafarers. They were camel herders. They were desert people. They were nomadic. They liked sand dunes. They didn't like sea waves. That's why look on the coast of Arabia today. You don't see many seaports there. And those that are there are new seaports. Historically, they've never been seafaring people. The Africans were, and that's why their names are on all these documents, which just blew out this trade route theory completely, proving that Mecca had nothing to do with the trade. Ooh, two, 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 two. Mecca had nothing to do with any of this trade. So how did Mecca get rich? How did get Mecca get important? She asked that question in 1987, and that's where she got her death threat for asking that question. Can you see there is a huge problem with Mecca? Well, let's look at Mecca today. And uh, on page nine, I've got the pictures up there. You can see what Mecca looks like today. And you can see that Mecca is has these huge, enormous buildings that they're building above the Kaaba. They have that that clock tower that's now the fourth highest building in the world. And that clock tower that has the largest clock in the world, 45 feet across that clock. And it's, they want to make it Mecca in mean time. They're building all these, they're building 62 of these structures. You can see pictures of them on page nine. You can see the pictures I've got of what Mecca is going to look like in the future. 
all these skyscrapers, huge buildings. Now, whenever you build skyscrapers, you've got to build foundations, don't you? You've got to build deep foundations to hold up those buildings. And when you dig those foundations, you dig up the history of the city, do you not? Every time you see in these ancient cities, look at Rome or Athens, London, many of the uh, Mahanjadaro that you have there in India. These are the great cities of India. Take a look. Whenever they build large buildings, they've got to dig down into the foundations and they start coming across artifacts, pieces of pottery, pieces of brick, pieces of inscriptions on tablets. And these are taken and they're given to the archaeologists and the archaeologists they love this because they then look at this and they can recreate the history of the city by looking at these artifacts and they have done that with mecca and so the archaeologists have come to mecca to pick up all these artifacts dan gibson went and talked to a number of them two years ago and asked what have you found guess what they have found zero nada not a thing they haven't found one artifact from Mecca, from these huge foundations that shows that this city has any history. Yet this city, this city should be giving us the largest number of artifacts because it's the oldest city in, uh, in the history of mankind. There's not one artifact that they've been able to come up with. Oh, they have found an old Turkish fort. In fact, the old Turkish fort was destroyed to make this building right here, the big clock tower. That's where the old Turkish fort used to be. That's the only thing. The Turkish fort is from 1400 AD, but nothing earlier proving that Mecca has no history. That's hugely significant. It's the only archaic city in the world that has no history, which suggests to me it's not archaic. We'll get back to that. Can you see then, if you have a problem with Mecca, you have a problem with the Qibla. Now, here is where we're going to now move into the material that we're going to open today. And it's this material on the Qibla that I want to introduce. But before we get into Dan Gibson's material, before we get into the PowerPoint, I just want to introduce why the Qibla is so significant. For those of you who are uninitiated, the Qibla is the direction of prayer. Every Muslim, when they go to a mosque, when they, even in their homes, they will find a, there is always a direction of the Qibla. I, if you go to hotel rooms, I remember when I was in Malaysia at Kuala Lumpur in my hotel room, there was on the wall a, an arrow that showed where the direction of the Qibla was if I wanted to do my prayers. Qiblas are absolutely important because everybody must pray towards Mecca. So the assumption has always been that Mecca has always been that, well, not always, because we know it was towards Jerusalem uh, for about from 622 to 624 for that two-year period, according to the Quran in Surat Ayah 2, Ayah 149, chapter 2, verse 149, that it was uh, for Jerusalem for those two years, redirected back down to Mecca. So by 624, every mosque, in every country, in every city should be pointing towards Mecca. Am I correct? Which means every mosque, because there were no mosques outside of Mecca Medina before 624. They were the first. So back in 1905, there were two uh, archaeologists, one named Dr. Creswell, the other named Dr. Fehervari, who were digging around in all the old, three of the oldest mosques that were unknown at that time, Two of them were in Iraq, called the Kufa Mosque and the Wasit Mosque. And the other one was further over to the west, sorry, in just outside of Cairo in Fusta, the garrison town. So you had two mosques in Iraq from Kufa and from Wasit, and one mosque over in Cairo called the Fusta Mosque. As they dug around to the original floor plans, they wanted to get the foundations of these buildings. They came across the foundations, and they came across the Qibla walls. When they looked at the Qibla walls, they noticed that the Qiblas were not facing Mecca. They were not facing south, as they should be. Over in Fustat, they were facing east. They were facing towards, they thought, Jerusalem. Over in Iraq, they were facing west. They thought towards Jerusalem in 1905. They just assumed, oh, these are, this, they were facing Jerusalem. So these must have been earlier mosques that had not yet been changed to Mecca. And that's where they left it. The problem is they didn't look at their directions very carefully because they didn't have GPS coordinates, coordinates like we do today. They didn't have Google Maps like we do today. They didn't have Aster satellites uh, technology like we have today. This is in 1905. And so they just assumed that this is from Jerusalem. And that's what most people have assumed. Until, of course, a new man named Dan Gibson. Dan Gibson. And here's where we're going to introduce 
our material today. So I'm now gonna go to PowerPoint. I'm gonna share a screen with you. You're all gonna see my PowerPoint. So you're gonna say goodbye to me and we're now gonna go to the new material that we want to introduce in today's talk. And this is known as In Search of the Man. And what I wanna do is I wanna go back down to this man, Dan Gibson. You all have this on your handout, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Let's just start from here so we can see what we're looking at. You can see, when you look at this, there's the map of the Wasit and the Kufa Mosque on the east and the Fustat Mosque in the west, pointing to what they thought was Jerusalem back then. But you can see they're not facing Jerusalem, and they certainly are not facing Mecca, way down to the south. So what are they facing? Well, let's go ahead and see what we do know. And let's go and ask, we also know of a document that was discovered from, written in 705, written by Jacob of Edessa, and he says this, so from all of this it is clear that it is not to the south that the Jews and the Maghre, the Maghre was the name for the Muslims at that time, they didn't have the word Muslim that early, here in the regions of Syria pray, but towards Jerusalem of the Kaaba, the patriarchal places of their races. Dan Gibson decided to do some introductions, do some studies, and so he wrote a number of books, one was called Ge uh, Chronic Geography in 2011. If you have a chance, get that book. You can get it in PDF form. It only costs $15, and you can pull it down in PDF or get the book itself. He spent from 1997 to 2004 doing his research in Jordan, in Yemen, as far away as Morocco, living amongst the people, and actually unpacking all this archaeological evidence. And then he came out with this book called, that you see there on the screen, Early Islamic Qibla, just in 2017. And this is the one that has blown open everything. In 2017, he then showed the 100 Qiblas, or the 100 mosques, and he noted that all of their Qiblas, well, let me just not say all, most of their Qiblas were not facing Mecca. So let's look and see what he's found. And this is where I'm going to look at not all hundred of them. We're just going to look at the most important ones. So let's take a look and see what we have found. Now, how did he find the Kiblas? Well, there's an awful lot of writing on this page. I won't go through every bit. He did not use Google Earth. Muslims have always claimed that he used Google Earth, and Google Earth is not accurate enough. Google Earth does not, it does not take into account the curvature of the Earth, so therefore it is not accurate enough to use. He used Advanced Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer, known as ASTER, uh, which takes pictures 260,000 photos every two days with reference points just 96 feet apart. That's how accurate it is. Comes out of Japan, and he used the Aster satellites to do all of his designations, to do all of his calculations. Now, fascinating, when he by using this, what he was able to find, if you want to see any of his material, you need to go up on his site called the Sacred City Canada. So go, there it is, the URL, go up and look at it, and you have every one of his his findings. You'll see every one of his mosques there. Uh, you look at the data and then go to early Qibla tool on the data on that site under tools. And you'll see all the papers and the maps that he has been. And he keeps putting up new ones there every week. Now, what did he do? Well, he went to these Qiblas and he looked at the, looking down from the satellites, he then measured the Qibla walls and all of them. Because of the fact that many people have thought that these are nothing more than solstice lines or equinox lines, he has also put the solstice and equinox lines, those are the little bl light blue lines, on every one of his photos. So you can see where the solstice lines are to prove that these are not following solstice lines, these are not following equinox lines. And uh, that's just to show another added feature. So what about these mosques that had no Qiblas? There are many mosques that today don't have early Qiblas, uh, and that's why he had a difficult world. What he did do is he went to those mosques. He didn't look for, because many of these old mosques from the 7th and 8th century have been destroyed. They're nothing more than ruins. Nonetheless, you can still see the foundations of those mosques. And he would go to the foundations, look at the original floor plans, and then he would measure the, the, the long walls. Now, unlike churches, churches are long and narrow, 
Moss are shortened and wide. And the reason why is because you want the longest line towards the Qibla, because you want the longest line of men or women standing there with their feet touching each other so that you get as much baraka. So every time you have toes touching, the longer the line, the more baraka you receive. That means blessing as you're doing your prayer. Baraka, 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 baraka. And so that's why it's important that when you look at the mosque, you, you, you look at the longest wall and it's either one of two walls in either one of two directions. That's where you know the Qibla wall is. Or you look for the mihrab the niche in the Qibla walls. But the earliest mosques did not have mihrabs. That was only introduced in the 8th century. So the 7th century mosques would have not had mihrabs. They only have Qiblas. Now, there are some like this one that I have there picture called the Qiblatain Mosque, which means the mosque of the two Qiblas. That was under that was the mosque that people, well, many people would always question. If you look at the green air, the present day mosque, it's facing Mecca. And so people are always questioning why it was called Qiblatain, the Mosque of the Two Qiblas, until 1987, when they were doing some excavation to clean up this mosque. As they were digging down in the western, uh, I'm sorry, the eastern wall, they came across a whole nother structure. And when they uncovered it, they found a new Qibla, a new mosque, a new foundation. And the Qibla for that mosque is the red arrow facing almost the entirely separate direction. That mosque is not facing towards Mecca. It's facing a completely different way. It is in Medina, so it should be facing south. It's not. It's facing north. We will show you where it's facing in just a bit. But just to show you what we're dealing with and how this works. There you can see a better picture of it. Now, looking and seeing where it was facing, should it have been facing Mecca? It's not. It's facing up north. So what's it facing? Well, if you look at a line, it looks like it's possibly Jerusalem. And so many people have always assumed it was facing Jerusalem. This is one of the earlier mosques before 624 when they were all directed. What's fascinating is, take a look what it also is uh, going over, the city of Petra. So let's come back to that. We'll come back to that in just a bit. Now, another mosque that was uncovered was the great Mon uh, mosque of Guangzhou. Now, that mosque is still standing, and it was built in 627. Now that's curious, 627. Muhammad would have still been alive at that time. Am I correct? Of course. This is in China. Guangzhou, that is the name for Canton today, just north of Hong Kong. And that mosque still exists. It still sits there. It was built in 627. And take a look at the four dials at the bottom. When you look at those four dials, those are the directions towards the one on the left is the actual mosque direction. The one next to it is how far it's off from Petra. The one after that is how far it's off from Mecca. And the one after that is how far it's off from Jerusalem. And you will see that it is within 2.81 degrees of Petra. It is for 4.86 degrees of Jerusalem. And it's 7.11 degrees off from Mecca. So obviously, the closest direction would be Petra thousands of miles away, and it's only 2.8 degrees off from Petra. So the closest Qibla would be Petrin Qibla. So that's Qibla number one, okay? We're going to look at four Qiblas. This is Qibla number one, and the earliest mosque that we can find that has a Qibla is facing Petra. You can see, looking at the lines there from a far distance, now this is Google Maps. I'm just showing you to give you an idea. Take a look at how far off it is from Mecca. The red line is the Qibla line for the Guangzhou Mosque. Take a look and see where it goes. It is not going through Jerusalem. It's not going through Mecca. It's going through Petra. Here is Sherman Juma Mosque in India. This is your country. Built in 629. Again, Muhammad would still be living at this time. In 629, look at the dials below, and you will see that the closest degree is Petra. It's less than half a degree in error showing it's almost exactly facing Petra, not Jerusalem, and certainly not Mecca. It's 75 degrees off from Mecca, proving how close it is to Petra, 629 AD. Here's the Jami Hama al-Kabir Mosque in Syria in 637. Again, look at the degree. It's less than a degree off from Petra. The day, a day, a degree of error is Petra. It's 25 degrees off from Mecca. So it's obvious that this is facing Petra. Petra, not Mecca. The Fustat Mosque in Egypt, 642. This is the one that Fehravadi and uh, Creswell found. That one is facing more like it is much closer to Petra 
and than any other. Here is the Dome of the Rock, very famous dome in Jerusalem. You can see it there today. It's a beautiful structure. Take a look at where it's facing. In fact, the entire structure is facing Petra, including the Alexamos, which we're going to get to. That was built in 709, but we're going to get to that a little later. The entire structure there in Jerusalem is facing Petra. The Humayma Mosque in Jordan, 699, we're still in the 7th century. It's closest to Petra, not Jerusalem, and certainly not Mecca. It's 133 degrees off from Mecca. Here's the Amman Mosque in Jordan. Now we're into the 8th century. Take a look at that. It's 11.34 degrees of error from Petra. It's within 22 degrees of error from Mecca. Therefore, it's closest to Petra. Here's the Grand Mosque in Sana'a in Yemen. Now we're in Yemen, 705, early 8th century. It's less than a half a degree off from Petra. Get about al Minya Mosque in Israel, 706. It's 0.8, less than a degree off from Petra. 22 degrees off from Mecca. Now take a look. What do we notice? We're now up to 706 AD. All of the mosques, you can see from the right coming in from China, from below coming up uh, from Sherman and also from the south, coming over from, uh, from, from Turkey, coming up down from Syria and coming over from Egypt. All of those. Take a look at where they're all facing. Where are they all going? They're all coming to Petra. That's how accurate all of these mosques are. Thousands of miles away, and yet they're all facing Petra. Here you have Medina, China, India, Syria, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Yemen, and Israel again. All of these mosques in the 7th century were up to 706. So every mosque up to 706. Remember, the Qibla was canonized in 624. Muhammad died in 632. So we're talking a good 70 to 80 years later. They are all facing Petra. Not one of them is facing Mecca. So that's Qibla number one. There you can look and see that all the 17 Petran Qiblas, except for two, fall within a 45-mile dotted circle, proving how accurate they were. This will become important later. There's the, all the Qiblas facing Petra. So I'm going to show you this map. I'll show you four, three more coming up. There you can see where all the Qiblas are, all facing Petra, not Mecca. And then in 706, a new direction came up, and this is known as the between. It was first started with a, a mosque named the Wasit, Great Mosque in Iraq. Wasit means between or in between. This is a Qibla that is not towards Mecca. It's not towards Petra. It's exactly in between. There you can see the mosque that we are going to find for in between. Notice there's nothing there. There are no cities there. There is no... Uh, rock outcropment there. There's no mountain there. They're just sand dunes. So why are they facing this location? Halfway in between Petra and Mecca. You're going to see why. But this is known as the between mosques. These are all started with the Wasit Mosque over there in the northeast. The Wasit Mosque was controlled by Al-Hajjaj, the governor of Iraq under the Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik. Hugely important. You will see why these between mosques were created. There is the Masjid Al Tariq in Iran, 708. It's facing Petra, not in between. It's back to Petra again in 708. Here's the Alexa Mosque in Jerusalem. Remember, I talked about Alexa Mosque there on the citadel, right in front of the Dome of the Rock, it's facing Petra. That's why we know the Dome of the Rock is facing Petra, because when you look at the citadel, you will see the entire citadel, both with the Alexa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, are all facing Petra, not facing Mecca. Here you have a Jami al Umayyad al Kabir Mosque in Damascus, 709, 8th century. It's in between. There is the second Qibla. The Kibbat al Mafjar Mosque in Jericho, it's facing Petra, back to Petra again. Here's the Anjar Mosque in Lebanon, 714. It's facing Petra. You can see very clearly that it's much closer to Petra than it is to Mecca. The Mosque of Umar in Syria, 721. It's facing in between. 721. We're almost 100 years after the canonization of the Qibla, and still not one mosque is facing Mecca. Here's the Hayat al-Kharbi Mosque in Syria, 726. 
We're now over 100 years after the, all the mosques were supposed to be, supposedly have been facing Mecca in 624. We're now in 726, over 100 years later, and this one's facing in between. It is this mosque, 727. This is the first mosque that has been found that's finally facing Mecca. Look at the date, 727. So this is Qibla number three. Qibla number one is Petra. Qibla number two is in between. Qibla number three is Mecca. Finally, we have a mosque facing Mecca, and it's over in Pakistan, real close to you all. There are the Meccan mosques, Banbor in Pakistan, and the other ones that we're going to get to. But very few are facing Mecca, even in the 8th century. Here you have the Qasr al-Hayr al-Sharqi Syria mosque in 728. It's in between. The Amman Citadel mosque in Jordan, 730. It's facing Mecca. But hold on a minute. I want to look at this one a little closer. You notice there are two mosques in that picture. Let's look at it a little closer here. You notice the bottom one with the red line going down south is the earlier mosque that I talked to earlier. Um, it's in, also in Jordan, in Amman. Notice it was built in 701, and it's facing Petra, right? Then another mosque was built above and behind it. There's the one that's, that you have the black line going towards. That's the newer mosque, built in 730. It's now facing Mecca. So two completely different mosques right next to each other, the lower one facing Petra, the upper one, the, uh, the more recent one, facing Mecca. What happened between 701 and 730 to change the Qibla? There you can see the change of the Qibla on two mosques right next to each other in the same place. We're going to get to that and show you why that's significant. The Jami al Zaytuna Mosque in Tunisia. Now notice, here is the fourth Qibla. Here is a completely new direction. And this is the first to show it in 732. This is the day, this is the year that Muhammad died. So this is the same year that Muhammad died. We get a first mosque that is not facing Mecca, not facing Petra, not facing in between. It's facing parallel. What do we mean by that? Take a look at this map here. All of the mosques that are built in North Africa or in Spain are on a parallel line straight south that parallels the line between, between Petra and Mecca. So why are they not facing Petra? Why are they not facing Mecca? Hold on. I'll tell you the reason. And it has to do with politics. It has nothing to do with theology. It has nothing to do with geography, per se. It has to do with politics. But hold on. We'll get to that. So here you have the Baalbek Mosque, 740, well into the 8th century. It's in between. You notice that. Another one, the Mushta Mosque in Amman, Jordan, 743. It's facing Petra. Here's the Haram Mosque in Turkey, 744, mid 8th century. It's in between. The Qasar, Ukaidir, the Kufa. There is another one in Kufa, Iraq, 764. It now is facing Mecca. It's facing the right side, but look at the dates. The Ribat Fortress in Tunisia, that's North Africa, 770. So it would be facing parallel. The Sahiramda, Bohar, Amman Mosque in 771. We're not quite sure, but it looks like the Qibla is closest towards Petra. It's certainly not Mecca. It's within a degree of Petra. The Suma il Omani Mosque in Oman, 771. We're still not sure of the date on that one. It's facing Petra again in Oman, down in the Sadrmat area. Here's the Raqqa Mosque in Syria, the made famous by ISIS. This is the Raqqa Mosque. It's still standing. Built in 772, it's facing in between. Remember, it's from Syria and Iraq where Al Hajjaj had control of these mosques. The Bibi Samarkand in Uzbekistan, way over in Uzbekistan, 773, we think it's 773, it's facing Petra. The Cordoba Mosque in Spain, because it's North Africa, it's parallel. The Jami Uqba, Ibn Nafi, Kirwan in Tunisia, again, North Africa, it would be parallel. 836, we're in the 9th century. So, note, there were four complete Qiblas. The first Qibla up till 706 were all facing Petra. The second Qibla uh, was the in-between. There are eight of them. The third Qibla, Meccan Qiblas, don't get introduced till 727. There are 10 of them. And then there are six parallel Qiblas over in North Africa in Spain. So the Qibla was not finalized towards Mecca until 876, the late 9th century. That's 250 years too late. What's going on? 
Well, I can see it's quarter af it's about quarter till uh, nine o'clock your time. We're going to take a quick break there. We're going to have about five minute break and then we're going to come back and we're going to get it. I'm going to unshare, stop sharing here so that we can go ahead and I can see a lot of you need something to drink. You'll need to get some tea and coffee. So let's go for five minutes and we'll come back in five minutes and start up again. And then we'll show you why all these Qiblas are not facing Mecca. Ooh, it's great stuff. But we've got to show using historical criticism. We've got to show looking at the evidence that's on the ground. See you in five minutes. This is Jay. Now, before we get into the PowerPoint, going back to the PowerPoint, I just want to show you the books. Here is a Nabataean. This is one, the first book that Dan Gibson wrote in 2003. Yeah, you can get on Amazon. You can get this one also. You don't have to get it on Amazon. You can get this right from Dan Gibson. This is Chronic Geography. You can also get this in PDF. Uh, this is looking, and this was put out in 2011, and this is the one that really blew open the whole problem with geography. But this is the book that I, I would recommend you get called Early Islamic Qiblas. And this is the one that you need to really unpack. It's very, it has lots of pictures full of pictures with all the mosques, all the different Qiblas in the different directions. And it's the one we're going through right now. So uh, go ahead and get those books if you can get it. That Those you can also get on Amazon. Uh, and I'm assuming you can get Amazon okay there in India, especially during this lockdown. So let's go ahead and start from where we started. And what I want to do is go right back to the PowerPoint and we'll continue with the PowerPoint uh, as we continue with our lesson. That's, so remember, we stopped with this thing. We talked about the four Qiblas. So uh, let's ask the question whether or not there's Qibla 1, the Petran Qibla up until 706. There's Qibla 2, the between Qiblas. Why are they between? Why are they all facing very accurately within one degree off, right there halfway between Petra and Mecca? There's Qibla number three. The Meccan Qibla, which is, as you can see, doesn't, into, doesn't even begin to appear until 727, over 100 years after the, the, the rise, or uh, you might say the, the, the canonization of the Qibla, suppose in 624. And then the parallel Qibla, that's the fourth one, Qibla number four in North Africa. So which were the most accurate? Dr. David King, who is the world authority on the early Islamic Qiblas, has come out against Dan Gibson and has said, well, the most accurate Qiblas were the Meccan Qiblas, and that's why the earlier ones were inaccurate, because they didn't have mathematics like the later Meccans had, and that's why the earlier Qiblas are all off. Well, if that were the case, well, let's see if that is correct. But take a look at the Meccan, uh, the Petran Qiblas. There are 17 of them. They're within 2.9 degrees of accuracy. If you take out the worst two, they're with under two degrees of accuracy. Between Qiblas are by far the, the most accurate. They are less than a degree off. Then the parallel Qiblas are 3.5 degrees of accuracy. And the worst ones, the ones with the least accuracy, are the Meccan Qiblas, which are the latest. So which completely blows that theory out of the water from Dr. David King. Why is it that the Meccan Qiblas were so accurate? Well, there's a reason. The reason why they were so accurate is because the earliest Arabs were Nabataeans. And the Nabataeans were the ones who could cross the deserts. They were the only ones that could cross the deserts. They're the, they were the, and the reason why they could cross the deserts to do the trade, they are the ones that could move, get, get all the way to India and all the way to China. And the reason is very simple. They used stars to be able to know where to go. Because remember, across, the deserts have no roads. They don't have any mountains. They don't have rock outcroppings on many of them. They're just sand dunes. And those sand dunes shift with the winds. And there are oases in those sand dunes, and the Nabataeans need to know exactly where those oases were so that they could water their camels. Otherwise, they would die. So they would, out of necessity, they had to be able to get from one oasis to the next. So how did they make it across those sand dunes? Well, they used astronomy, the study of stars. Now, what they did is they used a simple contraption like you can see there called the Kamal, the Kamal block. 
they would look where the North Star was, and that's why they always traveled at night, because it was the coolest time of the day. They would sleep during the daytime in their tents, protected from the sun, and then they would travel at nighttime, and they'd look for the North Star. And they would take that block, and they would put it up against the horizon, and they would put it up against the star, excuse me, and then they would take a string with knots on it, and they would pull the string until as it brought it back towards them, closer and closer to them, it got bigger and bigger, until the top of the Kamal block was touching the North Star and the bottom was touching the horizon. Once it stopped right there where it was then between the North Star and the horizon, they would look and see how many strings there were, how many knots there were on the string, and they knew exactly how far they had to go in either North or South. What they would do then is they would because it could be tens or hundreds of thousands of steps going north or south, and you would lose count. So what they would do is they would recite poetry. And they knew that if it's 100,000 steps in this direction, they knew that it would they would have to use this poet, this poem. And they would re recount the poem, and they would sing and chant the poem as they were walking. And as soon as they got to the end of the poem, they knew that they had come to the destination where they needed to change directions. So they would probably then have to go east or west. In order to go east or west, they had 32 different stars on the horizon that they knew. And these are the stars that were used, much like a compass that we have today. So let's say, for instance, they needed, let's say they went 100,000 steps going that piece of poetry to north. Then they had to go to the Naka. There's the Naka star, which is the northwestern direction. They would have to go 25,000 steps in towards the Nakan direction. So they got a whole another piece of poetry, another poem, and they would recite that so many times. And after they'd done it so many times, they reached to where their destination. And then they needed to go towards another star, Altir, in the eastern direction. And they had to do that 125,000 steps. And they recite another piece of poetry. And by doing that, they got exactly to the right destination, to the right oasis where the water was, and they survived. And that's how they were able to get across the desert, using stars either north, south, or east or west, and an awful lot of poetry. What's fascinating is, even today, those camel herders still use the same method. Dan Gibson found them, and he found that they were still using poetry, and that's why they love to recite poems, because it was their survival. If they didn't get the right number of steps using the right poetry, they would die of thirst. Now, why Petra then? Why are all these mosques facing Petra? Why was it the center of trade? Well, it was the Nabat it was the sanctuary for the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans, these were these traders. They Nabatea, the Petra was the center of their king. Now they didn't have a kingdom. They didn't have any borders. They were traders, so they were all over the world. But their sanctuary was Petra. And during the Umayyad dynasty, Petra was also the sanctuary for the Umayyads. The Umayyads had their tombs and temples there. Remember, it was the Nabataeans who, who be, then became the Umayyads. The Umayyads are descendants of the Nabataeans. And it's the Nabataeans that gave us Arabic. It's the Nabataeans that give us the name for Allah, the name for God. Alat and Uzza are Nabataean goddesses. So all of this comes from the Nabataean sect, from, from the Nabataean era and from the Nabataean people. Now, Mecca is missing when you look at these maps. Notice Mecca there, but take a look what is on all these maps. Petra is in all these maps. Petra was a center of trade. There's Petra, circled in red. I just want to look here to make sure everybody's on. Yep, everybody's on. Now, when you look at this map, you can see The one thing that is missing is the question mark down there. That's where Mecca should be on this map. This map again, Mecca is not there, but Petra is. There is Petra on this map, but it's not, it doesn't show Mecca where the question mark is. Remember this map that we showed the question mark? There's Petra again. So Petra is in this map, but it's not, it, or should I say, Mecca is not hugely revealing that Petra is in all of these maps, but not Mecca. The importance of Petra, well, it's a city of tombs and temples. It's where all these beautiful rock carvings are. It's, an, it's a natural wonder of the world today. You've seen pictures of it. If any of you, possibly some of you have been to Petra. 
And you can see that it would be the head of the sanctuary. It would be the seat of the sanctuary for all the Nabataeans all over the world. They were traitors, so they needed a place that they could send their bodies back to when they died. They needed a place that they could pray towards. That's why all of these mosques were Petran temples before they were Muslim mosques. And that's why when you look at the dates, like some of the dates for the earliest Qiblas were 627 and 632. Muhammad would still have been living there. But obviously, Muhammad was not from Mecca. He was from Petra. And if he did exist, he was much, much further north. And this would have been the sanctuary city that he is, would have prayed towards. What's more, when you look at all the vegetation, remember we talked about all the problems with uh, the vegetation that, and the, the pr difficulties with the description of what this place was where the prophet lived? in both the Quran and also the Islamic traditions. We were told that it's that this where this prophet lived was in a valley and had a parallel valley. That does not exist in Mecca, but you can see on the map on the right there, you can see the valley and the parallel valley there in Petra. Then it has a stream going through it. That There is no stream in Mecca at all. There's only the Zamzam well, uh, which is a, not, a well that could not have accommodated large caravans. But there are lots of wells, and there are lots of streams. There are two major streams that go through Petra. According to Sahih, uh, to uh, Surah 37, outside of this place where the prophet lived is the Pillar of Salt, supposedly referring to the wife of Lot. That you can find in Petra. Outside of Petra would be where that uh, Pillar of Salt would be. It's not anywhere near Mecca. That this place where the prophet lived has fields. It has Trees, grass, fruit, fruit, clay, loam, all these characterizations about this place where this prophet came from do not fit Mecca. They all fit Petra. What's more, it talks about olive trees. There are no olive trees at all in anywhere in Arabia, but there are in Petra. And it has mountains overlooking the Kaaba. There would be no mountains in Mecca, but there are in Petra. So Petra has all the items listed above coming from the Quran and the later traditions. Therefore, could Petra be the place they are referring to? Now, remember, we also talked about the people from Ad Tamud and Midian. 65 geographical references, nine places named, 23 times it refers to Ad, 24 times to Thamud, seven times to Midian. None of these are near Mecca, which is way down at the bottom on the map there. They're all way up near Petra. All of these people are around Petra, which would make sense then that this prophet, who's only named four times in the Quran, this prophet would be from Petra, much further north, 600 miles further north. Why is this significant? Well, first of all, what we knew, let's just review what we've already said. We know nothing about Muhammad until the late 7th century. We know nothing about his book, the Quran, until the early 8th century. We know nothing about his city until the mid-8th century, where his biography and sayings don't appear until the late, early to late 9th century. Thus, much of what we know about Muhammad is written down hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away. It looks like he is nothing more than a later redaction. That means put back by an, a later person, in this case, Abdul Malik. So we're going to talk about Abdul Malik. It looks like he is the one that introduces all of these things in 691 later. So therefore, the conclusion, Islam and the Prophet's life, as we know it, was not derived from the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years. Let's then go and let's ask this, what we know. Questions we still need to ask. Why are there no Muslim sources for 200 years? Why do the claims they make not fit the seventh century historical record? Why are the geographical references so few and confusing? And why do they all seem to fit an area much further north? Well, possibly because doesn't even suggest that there was no vegetation. Obviously, this would not fit Mecca. Much more so than that, Mecca is not on the trade route. It doesn't even appear till 741. It's not on any map until 980. So all these Qiblas, why are they facing Petra for the first hundred years? Well, I, at least up until 706. And they are not standardized to Mecca until 822, 200 years too late. Is it not surprising that historians now consider much of what we know about early Islam spurious? So here's the million dollar question. What then really happened? Okay, we need to answer that question, because I don't want to leave you sitting there hanging, wondering what's going on, Jay, why are you introducing all this material without giving us an answer? So what do we think really happened? Now, I'm saying this in May of 2020. If you were to ask me this in a year from now, it will probably change, because we're getting so much new material that's coming to the fore in our research. I'm doing a whole series 
of questions, looking at the, the anything to do with Islam in the seventh century on my Fander Films YouTube site. If you go up on YouTube, just put them P-F-A-N-D-E-R-F-I-L-M-S. I am now uh, unpacking, I'm putting up a new video almost every day. And these are all asking this very question. What really happened? What do we know about Islam? I'm going through a whole series of questions concerning any reference to a man named Muhammad from the seventh century, a book called the Quran from the seventh century, a place called Mecca from the seventh century. I'm asking whether there's any reference to people called Muslims from the seventh century or a religion called Islam. I'm asking those five questions. Is there anything we can find prior to 691? That's Abdul Malik prior to 691 that re re refers to anything that's Islamic. And Muslims are throwing me all kinds of things at me. And they're saying, what about this inscription? What about this letter from Muhammad? What about this building? What about this tablet? And I'm debunking every one of them. And every one of them are easy to debunk. Now that's going on as we speak. So come and join me at Fander Films, P-F-A-N-D-E-R, Film F-I-L-M-S on YouTube. And just take a look at what we're finding. I have a whole team that's helped me research this. But I'm putting the videos up there to confront them, debunking every artifact that they can come up with, showing that there was no Islam at all. There was no religion called Islam. We're not even show, sure if there was a man named Muhammad who even lived. However, I have not made that conclusion yet. I'm still trying to get to that conclusion. The last three videos that I just put up in the last three days are asking that question. In fact, I'm going to put up right after this, right after this YouTube, I'm sorry, right after the Zoom webinar, I'm putting up a brand new one asking that question. Did Muhammad exist? Hold on. Wait till you find out what we're, find, what we're finding. But that's all going up as we speak. So in order to make sense of all this, this is what we need to say. What we do know is this, and this we get from the later traditions. These are the Islamic traditions that appear in the 9th and 10th century. And what they tell us is that there was a man named Abdullah ibn Zubair who lived in Petra. He was the governor of Petra under Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik was the Umayyad Caliph who ruled from 685 to 705. That period from 685 to 705 was absolutely important. What we do know is that he was the governor, though he rebelled against Abdul Malik in 687. I'm sorry, 683. Rebelled against Abdul Malik, destroyed the Kaaba in Petra. Kaaba, that's interesting. I didn't know there was a Kaaba anywhere but Mecca. Evidently, there was a Kaaba. In fact, we have now found the Kaaba. That's for another time, not for today. We have now found the Kaaba in Petra. Left Petra and fled to the south. Where did he flee to? Possibly. Uh, he was possibly, he fled down to Mecca. What's interesting is, what was the Kaaba doing in Petra? Why wasn't it up in Damascus? We know that Mecca didn't exist yet, so it could have been Mecca that early. But he destroys the Kaaba, goes to Petra, and he takes the black stone with him. Ooh, two, 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 two. The black stone. Why isn't anybody talking about the black stone? If you look at the Kaaba today in Mecca, you will see the black stone is in the southeastern corner. That black stone, you can see hundreds and hundreds of Muslims kissing it when they're doing the circumambulation around the Kaaba, the, the Kaaba. Where did that black stone come from and why is it significant? That's a huge subject that I'm going to be doing a number of videos on. We now know there's a history to that black stone. We now know that that is a Nabataean stone. That is a Nabataean black stone that belonged to the Nabataeans in Petra. And wherever the black stone is, there's God's presence with it. That the God's presence was always with the black stone. That's why Ibn Zubair took the black stone with him when he left Petra. In taking it with him, he took God's presence out of Petra. The Abbasids then become his ally because he needs an ally. And the Abbasids who are headquartered in Baghdad, which used to be Stesiphon, which was the Persian Sassanian kingdom, the Abbasids hate the Umayyads. They were headquartered in Damascus. So you had the, the Umayyads in Damascus, you had the Abbasids in, in uh, Baghdad, and the Abbasids become allies with Ibn Ubil Uzbeir. Why? Because he has the black stone. So he has the mother road. Now let's take a look. The, let's look at the two cities here. Here's a map. There is Damascus. That is the political headquarters for the Umayyads. That is where Abdul Malik is in power. Here is Petra. All the Umayyads are facing Petra for all their prayers. That is their sanctuary. So their sanctuary is in Petra, circled in gold. Meanwhile, over here, the other black circle is Stesiphon. That later becomes Baghdad. That is where the Abbasids are in control. Their 
sanctuary then circled in purple becomes Mecca. So Mecca becomes their sanctuary after the sanctuary in Petra. Are you seeing that on the map? So the political, the two big political parties, the two big empires, the Umayyads that are in power, they control the Abbasids. The Abbasids hate them. They're over in the east. They're Persian. They're over in what is now today called Baghdad. The Umay Umayyads have Petra as their sanctuary. The Abbasids have Mecca with Ibn Zubair in the Black Stone. They then create a new sanctuary in Mecca. Now, Here's the difficulty. By the time of the Putmala comes to power in 685, they have been in power since 640, 650. So almost 40 to 50 years they have now been in power. Here's the difficulty. They are Hagarin. They are Ishmaelite. They are in the line of Abraham through Ishmael. But their cousins, the Jews and the Christians, are also in the line of Abraham, but not through Ishmael, through Isaac. And they are cousins with the Jews and Christians. The difficulty is the Jews and Christians have a prophetic line through Isaac. They also have a scripture, the Old and the New Testament. The Arabs have no prophetic line, and they have no scripture, which means they have no identity. They need an Arab identity. Abdul al-Malik now controls all the way from India in the east all the way to Spain, Andalusia, it's called then, in the West. So from Spain to India, all that land was under his control. Huge amount of land. His biggest competitor now are the Byzantines. They are Christian. They have a prophetic line. They have a scripture. The Arabs who control this huge empire south of them have no scripture and have no prophetic line. They need a prophetic line. They need their own identity. So what do they do? That's why Abdul Malik decides to create it. And that's why he does a number of things. He needs to create the identity. So how is he going to do that? Well, he builds this huge building called the Dome of the Rock right there in Jerusalem. Why in the world didn't he build it up in Damascus where he was living? Why didn't he build it the largest city of, his, of its time, Damascus? The reason he built it in Jerusalem, it was because of Byzantine Christianity. Byzantine Christianity already were in Jerusalem. They already had a sanctuary in Jerusalem, the Church of the Sepulcher. There's the Dome of the Rock. Can you see where the green arrows are pointing? There's the Church of the Sepulcher, which has been the sanctuary for the Byzantine Christians for all these years. Abdul Malik then builds this Dome of the Rock above looking down on the Church of the Sepulcher. Sepulchre. It is much bigger than any other building of its day. It, look how it stands out. Whenever you even go to Jerusalem today, you can see it from all over, that beautiful golden dome. It stands out like a huge structure. More than that, it's looking down over the Church of the Sepulcher. This is a one-up mention. This is now where he's creating his identity. He slaps it there, right there in 691. In 709, then, the Al-Aqsa Mosque is built much, much later. But that's after Abdul Malik. So don't worry about the Al-Aqsa Mosque right now. Look at the Dome of the Rock. That's the building that, where he is now stamping his authority above and beyond all the Christians and Jews. We are now the new men in town, is what he's saying. This is our structure. This is our building. Now, if you go to any Muslim today, what will they tell you about the Dome of the Rock? They will tell you that that building was built to commemorate the... Uh, the the Mi'az, the, the night of power, when Muhammad was told to get up and, uh, on the winged horse and to fly up to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem, right at that spot, to go up to the seven heavens. That's why they claim that building was built. But take a look at all the inscriptions. When you look about that, well, we will get to that. Let's come back to this, first of all. Notice where it's situated. It employs Byzantine architecture. It's much larger and more prominent than any other Byzantine structure. It sits above the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's situated in the holiest city for Jews and Christians. That's why it's not in Damascus or Mecca. There was no Mecca at that time. Muslims say this was because of the Miraz, the night journey, but is it? Let's look at the inscriptions. Now, the inscriptions, the only part of the Dome of the Rock that still exists today, the only part of the Dome of the Rock that is still, um, that's still in existence is those two inner ambulatories. See those two inner ambulatories? Those are the only part that still exists today, where the two green arrows are. They are, why? Because the building has been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times over the centuries. 
the big structure you're looking at today it was only built in 1876 so it's a much it's not it's just a little over 100 years old but the earliest the earliest structure are those two sat rounded arches those are called ambulatories where the green arrows are and that's what you need to look at because those come from the time of Abdel Malik when you look at those two ambulatories you will notice that they have inscriptions written in Arabic take a look at the Arabic I know you can all read Arabic so you'll have no problem reading what they say let me help you out this is what they say now notice Muslims say that this was built to commemorate Muhammad going through the seven heavens let's see if the inscriptions say that there you find Surah 4, Ayah 171. These are references to the Quran. These are references coming out straight out of the Quran. Chapter 4, verse 171. O people of the scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter aught concerning Allah, save the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger, and his word which he conveyed unto Mary, and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messenger, and say not three, cease. For is it far is it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son? This is not talking about the miraz. This is not talking about the movement up to the seven heavens, which is what the Dome of the Rock is supposedly built for. It's attack against Jesus. It's attack against his, the Trinity. It's attack against Jesus' divinity. And it's attack against his sonship. Surah 17, I 111. Who hath not taken unto himself a son, and who hath no partner, nor hath he any protecting friend through dependence. That's attacking the fatherhood of God. That's attacking the sonship of Jesus. He's attacking Jesus' divinity. Look at chapter 112. And here is where Abdul Malik then introduces who he is confronting. There is no God but God. There is, there is the beginning of the Shahada. He is one. He has no associate. Now, that's not part of the Shahada today. Isn't that interesting? So who is that attacking? Who do they believe has an associate? That is Jesus Christ. See, he is God. He is the one, God, the eternally besought of, the, of all. He begetteth not, nor was begotten. He has none comparable unto him. Muhammad is the messenger of God. Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Here you have now Muhammad introduced. This is the first time we see Muhammad introduced into any inscription. So what you find on these inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock, they're all attacking Jesus' divinity. They're attacking the Trinity. They're attacking Jesus' sonship. They're attacking the fatherhood of God. They're attacking also the idea of begetting. What was fascinating then, they then introduce Muhammad. So they're attacking Jesus as the God of Christianity, attacking it, putting it on the Dome of the Rock, looking down over top of the Church of the Sepulchre, right below it there in Jerusalem. And this is where Abdul Malik then introduces Muhammad. This is the first time we see Muhammad's name on any Islamic or Muslim source. Before this time, you cannot find Muhammad's name earlier than this. Can you see why this is significant? Now, while he's doing that, he is also writing protocols. These are the official documents that all the caliphs put together. We have protocols from the time of 661 during the Sufyani period from 660 up until 680 when the Marwanids then came to power within the Umayyad dynasty. The Marwan I, these, his protocols we have access to. And then we have the protocols of, of the Malik. Dr. Yehuda Nevo has done the, 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 probably the most a germinal study on these protocols. And he has noticed that all the protocols for the Umayyad dynasty, including the Sufyani family and the Marwanids, have no reference to Muhammad, have no reference to the Quran, have no reference to people called Muslims, have no reference to a religion called Islam, and have no reference to Mecca in any of these protocols. Yet these should be full of references to those five things, because these are supposedly the first Muslims. So all the official documents of these caliphs from the Umayyad dynasty, dynasty, all the way up until 691, when Abdul Malik is in power, in 691, overnight, suddenly the Shahada is introduced, that there is only one God but God. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is only one God but God, and Muhammad is the prophet. This is introduced in 691. That's 60 years too late. Nothing before 691. So it's introduced on the Dome of the Rock, there on the inner pro uh, ambulatories in the inscriptions. It's also introduced on the Caliph of Protocols in the same year. And then it's introduced on the coins. 
Now, I've done a whole series of lectures on the coins, and we're going to be doing another lecture coming up, because the coins, are, I think, are probably the most devastating when it comes to a historical critique of Islam. I don't want to spend too much time here, because we're going to do a whole other lecture, possibly next week or the week after, on just the coins. When you look at the coins, and the great thing about coins is they are, you can handle them, you can look at them. They are material that actually is extent. That's why they are so devastating, because they don't deteriorate, they don't de disintegrate. They are made out of metal. They're made out of either of gold or copper or silver. And you have the coins that are coming from the Byzantine era. They tend to be gold solidices. You can see an example of that. There's a Byzantine dinar on the upper left there. That is a Byzantine dinar of the emperor uh, with his two, his two sons. Uh, that is... Heraclius with his two sons on either side, and on the back side of the coin is the Byzantine cross. Then you get to the Sufyani dirham. The Sufyani dirhams are introduced in 661. They are to the east. And the Sufyani dirham are from the eastern part of the empire. They, I'm sorry, no, those are still the western part of the empire. Take a look at that, and you'll see a cross on the top of the head of the of Caliph Mu'awiyah. Caliph Mu'awiyah has a cross above his head and he's also holding a cross. What in the world is he doing holding a cross if he's a Muslim? What are crosses doing on Muslim coins? Obviously, he was not a Muslim in 661. Then you get to 685 to 692 and you see these coins that introduce on the right, upper right-hand side. This is Abdul Malik. He is the first to introduce gold solidices with his image on it. There's his image with a big sword. And around him, and also on the backside, are the shahada. There you see the shahada. There's only one God but God. And Muhammad is his prophet. And then you see the, a mockery of the Byzantine cross on the backside of the crone. They take uh, the coin. They've taken the cross piece off as a mockery against the Byzantines. This caused the war with Justinian II, who went to war with Abdul Malik because he introduced this coin. In 696, then he introduced the most devastating coin, and this is the coin with not only the Shahada, he's taken his image off now, and he's introduced the Shahada plus it's an attack against the Trinity, it's attacks against Jesus' divinity, and it's attack against his sonship. All of these are written on that coin, all attacking Christian Byzantine Christianity. It's all attacking our Lord Jesus Christ and the Trinity and him as savior. Now let's move on. We'll be doing more of that. I don't want to get into that too much today because we have a lot more to do yet. Oh, I see I had some arrows there. Once they have the, the, once they have the man there, once they have him introduced on the Dome of the Rock, it's larger than any other no, um, no, uh, non-Arab structure. It's facing the Arab sanctuary, Petra. It incorporates inscriptions against Byzantine Christianity. It introduces their faith, Islam. It introduces their people, Muslim. And it introduces their prophet. The Caliphal Protocols also introduce Muhammad as well. And then the new coins are minted between 692 and 696. They replace his image and introduce Muhammad. And this is where the Shahada is introduced on the coin. So now you have the man introduced on the Dome of the Rock. You have the man introduced on the Caliph Protocol. And you have the man introduced on the coins. Remember, the, the whole idea of this lecture is looking at, looking in search of the man. We now have found the man. But look at the date he is introduced. The man Muhammad is not introduced till 691, 692, and 696. That's the late 7th century. Once they have the man, they need to have the book because every man has to have a book. We're going to be doing a whole series of talks just on the Quran. That's coming up yet. That's yet for us to do. Abdul Malik is the one that introduced Muhammad. He then needs to have an Arab's revelation in order to have this Arab identity. What we do know, and I can just say this real quickly, is that we have no manuscript of any Quran from the 7th century. We have nothing from the time of Uthman. We have nothing from the time of the Sufyani period. We have nothing of the, from the time of the Marwanid period. It is only with Abdul Malik that we start seeing Quranic texts. You can see it on the Dome of the Rock. Those were Quranic verses. But they're not the same verses that we find in the Quran today. They have additions that have been taken off since the Quran was written. So we know that the Quran was probably put together after he introduces Muhammad. He then needs to have a book. All the earliest Quranic texts appear in the 8th century and 9th century, not in the 7th century. What's more, none of them, the, of the earliest manuscripts are complete. None of them are actually parallel with the Quran we have today, and none of them are even parallel with each other. 
So when was the Quran finalized? Well, it was only finalized in Cairo in Egypt in 1924. It was finalized in the whole country of Egypt in 1936, and it became only finalized for the entire world in 1985. That is 25 years ago. The book that I have in my hand today, the book that you are all using, was only finalized in 1985 by, uh, by King Fahd. It's known as the Fahd edition, though it refers to the Hafs Quran that was first chosen by Muhammad al husseini al-Haddad, a scholar there at Al-Azhar University in 1924. Now they've got the book. They also have the man. They need a place. So you have these two great empires were competing for this Arab sanctuary. The Umayyad sanctuary in Petra that I showed you on the map earlier was destroyed by earthquake in 713. Thus, now that Petra was completely destroyed, remember the black stone was already taken out in 683 by Ibn Ubn Zabar. He ran with it down to the south. Now that Petra was destroyed by this earthquake, there was now no need to use Petra anymore. It pretty much had lost its significance. And that's why Mecca now is replacing Petra, first noted in 727. Ibn al-Zabed is the one who then creates Mecca. Why? Because he has the black stone. As he has the black stone in Mecca, then you can see a problem. Because we, where the black stone is the presence of God. So people are now starting to make pilgrimage down to him, down in Mecca. Now can you see why you have the four Qiblas? Let's see why. In order to understand the four Qiblas, you need to understand what was happening politically between the Abbasids and the Umayyads. The Umayyads were up in Damascus facing Petra. The Abbasids were in Baghdad facing Mecca. You have uh, Al-Hajjaj. Al-Hajjaj is the governor of Iraq. He does not like Abd al-Malik. He has seen what Ibn al-Zubayr has already done. He rebels against uh, uh, Abd al-Malik in 705, in 706. He then builds his own mosques. And that's why you can see that his mosques now come into existence. When you look at his mosque, his mosques come into existence in 706. They are not facing Petra. They are not facing Mecca. They're facing exactly in between. The 11 mosques that he built all are facing that one point. Why? To say to both the Umayyads and the Abbasids, I'm not following either of you. I'm going to see who is going to win out. He's basically hedging his bets. The same thing is happening with North Africa and Spain, with the parallel mosque. In North Africa and Andalusia, they realize that there's a real tussle happening between the Abbasids and the Umayyads. They don't want to be actually score with either one of them. They're waiting to see who's going to win out. And once they see who's going to win out, then they will then have their mosque facing that city. But until then, they just have their mosque facing straight south, parallel to the line between Petra and Mecca. This is a political gesture for out of expedience. So both the between mosques and the parallel mosques are nothing more than a political statement by both the North Africans and those who are under the authority of a judge. These two groups are waiting to see who would have control. When the Abbasids finally overpowered the Umayyads in 749, that's the mid 8th century, most of the Qiblas then faced Mecca. With a few holdouts, there are still some who do not want to uh, adhere to the Abbasids until 822, until the 9th century, at which time after 822, all the mosques then begin to face Mecca until the present time. So these Qiblas were chosen for political purposes, not for religious purposes. Are you following the significance of that? So let's look at a possible scenario. What if is that, what has happened? Once they get their prophet Muhammad, then they have the revelation, the Quran, then they have their sanctuary Mecca. They then need to have a history. They need to put a bones to all this. That's why it is not till 833, till the early 9th century, that the Siddha is finally written down. It's not till 870 that the Hadith are finally written down. And it's not till 923 and later that the Tafsir is finally written down. So by the 9th to 10th century, they then have a book, the man, the place, and the story. A new religion is formed and growing, yet not one that was created in just 22 years, like Muslims like us to believe, between 610 and 632, but evolved over two to 300 years. It has everything to do with politics. It has nothing to do with theology. It has nothing to do with Muhammad. It has everything to do with what the caliphs were doing. 
Let's summate. Let's put it all together. Why are there no Muslim sources for 200 years? Why do the claims they make not fit the historical record? Why are the geographical references so few and confusing? Why do they all seem to be much further north? Why are there no, so much references, so many references to vegetation which would not exist in Mecca? Why is Mecca not mentioned until 741 and not included in any maps until 980? Why do all the Qiblas face Petra for the first hundred years, then are confused for the next hundred and are not standardized to Mecca until 822, 200 years too late? And why why do the seventh century Arab coins have no traces of Islam on them at all until 692? What is Abdul Malik's role in all of this? And does a nascent Islam really begin with him? So what about Muhammad? Well, since what we know much about him is uh, uh, about him in early uh, Islam from the traditions is now in doubt, since much of the crown is also in doubt, since nothing is known of Muhammad until the late seventh century or Mecca until the mid eighth century or his story until the ninth century, hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away, can we then conclude that Islam is nothing more than a later redaction possibly begun by Abdul Malik and then continued by his descendants, proving that Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran. So who was he and what was his purpose? It looks like the Muslims have the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Ooh, tu, 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 tu. Now, let's ask the same thing about Jesus. We need to go like with like. How should we critique him? Using the same criteria, the same historical criteria I've just used on Muhammad, let's ask the same of Jesus. What do we know about him? Well, we know where he was born in Bethlehem. We know where Jesus grew up in Nazareth. We know where Jesus died and when in Jerusalem. We know what Jesus did for the last three years of his ministry. We know this from eyewitness accounts, Matthew and John. We also know this from hostile accounts like Thallus, Tacitus, and Josephus. We know when they were written down, these gospel accounts, between 50 to 60 years. We know that few doubt his historicity. Thus, we as Christians have the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. Ooh, it makes my job so easy. So what are we doing from here? Well, we, first of all, we must thank the historian for what they have done, but then we need to move this question on. We need to continue to do research and expand. We need to confront Islam's historical foundation. We need to challenge Muhammad in the Quran. We must demand the same of the Bible and Jesus Christ, of the Upanishads, the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita. We need to do the same with the Granth Sahib. We need to do with any book that claims to be historical, of which every revelation does. We must bring both into this public sphere and then let people come to their own conclusions. Why? Because the similar historical questions have already been asked of Jesus Christ and Christianity, and we've answered every question. Folks, we need to bring our Muslim friends home. Okay, that's it for today. I've stopped the screen. Now, what I want to do is I... I've said an awful lot. This has been an awful lot of material thrown at you at one time. I'm sorry, but uh, you can understand why. What we're going to do now is I'm going to go over and I'm going to look at the chat and I'm going to try to answer your questions. And I understand it's, a, it's probably 930. Is it not your time there in India? Okay, so it's getting late. So I don't want to spend too much time. I'll try to hurry up through these. So let me see. Whoa, there's lots of questions. Okay, let's try to get through these questions as best we can. Um, how many ex-Muslims are there? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, um, Pastor Sheikh, do you know the answer to that? How many ex-Muslims are there in this in your group? Um, uh, we have around uh, ten to fifteen um, ex-Muslims in our in our group, including yourself, right? Yep. Okay. So it would be nice maybe to just, uh, you're, in some ways, you're, you're unique because of the fact that you are an ex-Muslim. It's great to have you on board. And, some, and in some ways, from here on out, I might be throwing things at you to get your response to it, including this kind of material. Have you heard this material before as a, as a Muslim? Uh, uh, no. So this is new for you? Yeah, absolutely. Have you heard it from me before, any of this material? Uh, I some time ago just I heard you speaking uh, different uh, other subjects, but not the Kiblers and all these things. This is absolutely. Uh, uh, Jay, I have listened to it. Thank you. Okay, so some of you have listened to this. All right, what is your impression? Just I want to get from the ex-Muslims. What is your impression from what you've heard today? Uh, it is absolutely very interesting. Now, just we could uh, put the dots in the framework. Why, uh, where it started, why it started, 
what are the political reasons and what are the religious reasons behind all these Qiblas and their book and the man and uh, uh, Siratul, um, uh, uh, Siratul Rasul and uh, Hadiths and all these things, why they came into existence. Now just we can connect the dots. It is absolutely fantastic, very helpful. And did you notice that mo almost anything, everything I've done in the last two hours has been done from a neutral standpoint? Have you noticed I could be anybody saying this? Yeah, that, that is very interesting because uh, without offending anybody, uh, without anybody to raise the flag, we always can take this material and uh, put it in front of their table and ask. It's a very genuine question. So... It's as neutral as you can get. And Sheikh, what also I like about this is that I cannot be taken to prison. I cannot be taken to court because Muslims know that if they're going to take me to court for what I have just said, I'm just going to repeat and ask him, what is it that's hateful about this? What is it that's Islamophobic? This is your own material. I'm looking at your own historical sources. I'm going to your traditions. This is Al-Buhari. This is Sahih Muslim. This is Ibn Hisham. This is al wakiri This is Ibn Ishaq. This is Al-Tabari. This is Baidawi Zamakshari. These are your men. I'm quoting them. I'm only looking at your material and I'm asking historical questions which have already been asked of the Bible and have been asked of Jesus Christ. I'm now asking it of you. Where is there hatred in that? Where is anything Islamophobic about that? What we have noticed is that none of us are taken to court for this. We can't be taken to court because in doing that, we're just going to repeat what we've already said and it's going to be a second blast against them and this time will be much more public and the Muslims know that and they realize that and so that's why they're le letting us alone because they, first of all, they don't want this to be repeated publicly but secondly they don't want to be caught hot red-handed because i have yet to see one muslim in 25 years that can answer anything i've just mentioned today mm. and what's most exciting we're bringing hundreds of muslims to christ through this we have Amen. already brought over 125 to christ just from this material from people that we have heard about can you then understand this can this will then have repercussions for years to come and i think Amen. I, just on Friday, another man just gave his life to Jesus Christ from this material that emailed me. A week ago, I got another man who came and said, because of this video that I saw on the problem with, the, with Islam in the 7th century, I've given up Islam, I've become a Christian. And so we're starting to see this steamroll because it is so neutral, because it is not a Christian polemic. We're not hammering them with Bible verses. We're not sitting there and saying, because we as Christians don't like your prophet, because A, B, C, and D reasons. We're not even talking about his problems uh, internally or his problems sexually. We're talking about a historical critique. Because it's so neutral, because it's so historical, everybody can accept it. And also, it is politically correct. Have you noticed? Everything yes. I've said today is politically correct. There is no, uh, there is no rhetoricism in it. And that's why it makes it so much easier to use in the public sphere. So I hope this is something that you've noticed also faster. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I always, whenever just I used to get into the discussion, it's always uh, the war between the Bible and the Quran, but uh, uh, it is like uh, beating the bushes around. But now with this historical criticism, we are not mentioning the Bible, we are not mentioning anything, we are not mentioning any hatredness, but straight away just we are asking their historicity, their evidence to whatever they have mentioned. So absolutely, this is uh, very interesting. Now I have um, a lot of confidence that I can put these questions in front of my Waikos, my relatives, my friends, to whomever just I, I've been just discussing. It's very okay. easy now. One of the, one of the, uh, one, when I left Speaker's Corner in 2017, one of the last people that I, met, I left was an atheist who came up to me and said this very thing. He said, you know, you're the first one that's actually speaking our language. You're not telling us about your testimony, why it's good for you, because it's not the same for us. You're asking something much, much. You're actually asking the right questions. You're asking, is it true? Just three mm -hmm. words. Is it true? And you're asking the same question of Christianity that you're asking of Islam. You're asking this, you're saying, listen, we, we need to also have this criticism done of the Bible and of the person of Jesus Christ, which has been done for over 200 years. So in some ways, we're way ahead of the rest of the world because we've had it thrown at us since the 1800s. But because of that, I said to him and I, in my response, I said, yes, I'm glad that you like this material. I'm glad that you like to use it, but please don't because you have nothing to offer them. You have nothing to replace it. You just want to destroy Islam historically. You just want to destroy the Quran, but what do you have to offer instead of the Quran? 
You don't have the Bible. I do. You just want to destroy Allah, but who do you have to offer? And uh, if you can destroy Allah, I want to bring him to Yahweh. You just want to destroy the person of Jesus, Issa, in the Quran. Oh, I want to bring him to Yeshua. And so I said, for this is really a this is really material that we need to use as Christians. We are the only ones that have the alternative. We are the only ones that have the antidote. We have the only ones that have really the answer for the Muslims. So I'm glad that the, the atheists and the humanists like it, but I would rather they not use it because I do not want them to destroy the Muslims' faith. Yeah. I do not want them to destroy their belief in revelation or their belief in God or their belief in Jesus. I just want to bring them home, which we can do better than anybody else. So, Pastor Sheikh, thank you so much. Let me see if I can get through some of the other questions here. Sure, sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, he's an ex-Hindu. Okay, everybody in the center. Okay. That's from Dana. Thanks, Dana. Um, okay, now these are the are these the names, Sheikh uh, Salim? Are these the ones, Sheikh Salim, Zabur, Sid, Mudigan, Ahmed, Ghazi? These are the Muslims who are on the list? Yes. Okay, so these are the Muslims that are on the list. Now, here's a question. You said some believe Muhammad dies, died of poison. Isn't it clear he states by him that he experienced his aorta severe by the poison he ate at al khabar Exactly. This is what the traditions say, that his aorta um, was inflamed from inside, that he, was, that he went through, he succumbed over a period of a month, two months. But everything that we're hearing about Muhammad, everything that you're talking about, even the references to poison, have to do, have come from the Islamic traditions were written two to 300 years later. Therefore, I find them all suspicious. And that's why I know this is caused, if you look at what's happening on Fander Films right now, I'm having an awful lot of kickback from Muslims and also from Westerners and Christians who don't like the fact that all these stories sound, uh, surrounding Muhammad may be fraudulent because they're written so late. They're written long, long after 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 Muhammad, if he if he even existed, uh, died. So all these stories about poison do come out of Al Tabari and also come out of Ibn Hisham, which would be the Sira and also the Tafsir. Here's another question: How about using the contradiction of who is the first Muslim? How about using the contradiction of who's? The, uh, I'm not sure what the Jerusalem is never mentioned in the Quran. Is it something that we can ask the Muslims any hadith where Jerusalem is used? How did al-Buhari collect his data since he trashed around 90% of the data and detail, any details in the logic and such he used for the sake? Again, I, again, rather than getting in and trying to defend the traditions, what we do know is that according to al-Buhari in 870, al the, he himself was given 600,000 of these traditions, these akhbars. And he was to whittle them down and just throw out anything that he did like. And he threw out actually 98%, not 90%, but 98. He only retained 2%. He only retained 7,397 out of 600,000. Why in the world did he throw out the 98% is my question. And what was in that 98% that he saw fraudulent? And how could he know what was true or not since he was writing in 870, Muhammad died in 632? And he was writing hundreds of miles away. His name is Bukhara, from Bukhara, which is a town up near Uzbekistan. He was probably in Baghdad at the time, but he was not even an Arab. He would have been a Persian, writing about a man that lived 200 years earlier, 250 years earlier. He had never been to that part of the world and never lived in that part of the world. So how could he have known anything about this man or what he said or what he was, was happening? So I would suggest that this 600,000 willing him down to... 2% that an awful lot of the 98% that he threw away what is material that did not fit his paradigm, did not fit his theology, did not fit the man that they were looking for. Because remember, these traditions were to give body to this man, Muhammad, to give him a place, to give him a history, to give him also a sense of being a prophet. That's why they were all created so much later. Much of it, therefore, is nothing more than a bias. Um, Historical critique of the Quran by a Christian, will it be accepted by the larger Muslim community or how effective will it be? What is your experience? Exactly. Brilliant question. And Philip, this is a real problem that many Muslims always come up to me and they say, well, who are you to ask these kind of questions? And who are these people you're talking about? Dr. Patricia Corona, Dr. Dr. John Wansborough, Dr. Gerald Hotting, all these big, big names, but they're all Westerners. None of them are Muslim. And I said, isn't that telling right there? The fact that they're not Muslim, the fact that not one of these is Muslim, not one of them is a Muslim. 
shows me that Islam hasn't even asked these questions. Why is it that there's not one Muslim scholar that you can name me who has asked these questions? Why is there not one Muslim scholar who's looked at the Quran critically? Why is there not one Muslim scholar who has gone to these Qiblas, who has gone to these mosques, who has looked at their direction? Why have no Muslims done what we're doing? So I just throw it right back in their laps. And I said, it's because of the fact that we in the West, here in Europe and the United States and in India, those of us who have a Western tradition of criticism, based, bi bi pulled out, or come, which has come out of biblical criticism, it's because we understand redacted criticism. We understand source criticism. We understand that you, if you're going to look at documents that are not two to three hundred years old later, you're not going to trust those documents. That's why we'll need to go back to the seventh century. We're the ones that have done that with our Bible. Why haven't you done that with the Quran? We're the ones that have done that with Jesus Christ. Why haven't you done that with Muhammad? So I would suggest to throw that, that story, that, that question right back into the Muslim's lap and say that you show me one Muslim scholar that's asked these questions. Give me one book that's written by a Muslim on the problem of the Kirat or the Ahruf, the, uh, no, sorry, not the Kirat, that's uh, on the continental text of the Quran. Or is whether or not Muhammad can be found from any sources from the seventh century. The fact that this is not being done by any Muslim is not only telling, but shows that Islam does not, does not know how to answer this question. So I just like to throw it right back in their laps rather than say, trying to defend that. So according to you, what is the simple way to reach Muslim communities? That's really not the subject for today. That's for, we'll be coming up to that on methodology in another talk. So we'll hold off to that one till we get to that talk. The statement of history that you have mentioned here about Muhammad, uh, are historically 100% true that he lived from this period. I'm not sure what the, what John, John what, if you can rephrase that, I'm not sure what you're asking. Is it that I'm saying it's 100% true? I would say no. I would say it's 100% false. <laughs> that, is it, did he live or not? That's the big question that we're all asking right now. Did he exist? Personally, yeah. I believe there was a Muhammad. John, are you there? Let's put you on. Yeah. Go ahead. What, what does I mean, he say? Yeah. I was just asking, like I've heard somebody say that the, this person named Muhammad, did he really exist? No, but is the, there's no 100% proof. That's what okay. they say. Yeah. And that's the, I mean, th this, this book right here, that's been, that's, that's been, uh, uh, by Robert Spencer asked that question. Did he even exist? And John, what we're finding out is because we can't find any reference to him out within any Arab sources. I'm not saying Muslim sources. I'm saying even Arab sources. There's no reference to him until 691. If that is the case, if this man is that important, if this man started and received the revelation, started the religion, why is it we can't find anything about him from any Arab sources until 691? That's the first question. So I'm not willing to say right now that he didn't exist because we do have the Doctrine of Iacobi from 634. We have the, the writings of Sabaeus from 660 that do refer to him by name. Those are Christian sources. But they do not give uh, that what they say about Muhammad is not the Muhammad we know in the traditions, is not the Islamic Muhammad. First of all, the Muhammad they're referring to is a man who is a leader of men who is attacking other people, primarily Christians. So he is a warrior. Secondly, he is not referred to as a prophet. There's no reference to any Quran. There's no reference to the fact that he's a Muslim or that he is, represents Islam. And there's no reference that he's from Mecca. It looks like all the reference we have to this man named Muhammad is 600 miles further north possibly Petra. They don't say the name because there's not much written about him. There's just two or three sentences. F for that reason, I'm willing to say that he did exist, but it looks like he was a Nabataean who lived in Petra, who wanted to raid people and wanted to take their goods. He was basically a brigand, and that's why he moved into the vacuum that existed there between uh, the Sassanid period and the Byzantine material. But that is much, much further north. None of that takes place down in the Hejaz. So the Muhammad that we're talking about that, that, that uh, Spencer is asking about, the Muhammad that Muslims talk about is the Muhammad of faith, but not the Muhammad of history. I could go on for hours on that, but great question. Thanks, John. That's been very helpful. Um, go up on my YouTube channel. Go up on Fander Films. I'm talking about this very thing even today. I'm going to be putting up a new v uh, YouTube a video right after this session that's going to talk about that very question. You're going to see how my answer there as well. Both Jesus and Saul came from the Jewish faith and culture. To justify anyone who's not an ex-Muslim using polemics, do we have any scriptural references for polemics? Yes, um, it's too bad for, for some of you who have not heard this talk that I have done on apologetics and polemics. I'm going to be doing that talk in Ethiopia at 2 o'clock this afternoon, and then I'm doing it uh, 
to the North and South America uh, to about 60 to 200 people this evening at nine o'clock, all on why do we need apologetics and polemics. For some of you who have already been on this course, we've already talked about apologetics and polemics. There's reference after reference after reference to polemics. The entire Gospel of John is a polemic against the Gnostics. Take a look. John wrote it later for that reason. That's why it's not systematic, it's theological. And that's why the Christology of Jesus is so strong in the Gospel of John, more so than the others, because he's attacking the, the, the Gnostic belief that Jesus is not God. So there is a polemic. The entire Gospel is a polemic. If you look at the book of Acts, look at chapter 17, 18, and 19. If you want to find polemics, look at Paul's ministry. His entire ministry was polemical. In Laodicea, in Cappadocia, and Berea, and there in Ephesus, he went right into the synagogues, and he confronted the Jews with what they had done to the Messiah. He got thrown out. He got thrown into prison. He got whipped. He got twice almost stoned to death. He caused a riot in, in Ephesus, and he was finally killed in Rome. You do not get stoned. You do not get whipped. You do not get thrown into prison, and you don't cause riots, and you don't get killed for simply using irenics. He was absolutely polemical, and that's why he was a he was uh, the apostle to the <laughs> To the Gentiles, but his his whole methodology was polemical. Why have we lost that polemics? Why have we lost that ability? Look what he was doing in the Areopagus. It says for two years in Acts 90, for two years he argued in the debating chamber. The, the lecture hall of Tyrannus was a debating chamber. Why aren't we debating this anymore? Now, you Indians know what I'm talking about because you have a tradition of debate. It's called monozadas. You've had monozadas for centuries. You should be our best debaters. That's why I want to get you guys and wake you up to start debating this material because you're the best at it. You're so far ahead of the rest of the world. We need to get you guys and gals into debate. And that's what Paul was doing there in Acts 19 in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, what he was doing in Arapagus when he was confronting the Stoics and the Epicureans. He was confronting them with their own God. And that's what I want to see more of, people who are confronting the gods of others, specifically the God of Islam, Allah. So there's lots of scriptural references for it. It's just that we don't like to talk about it, and we don't even use that word anymore, and we don't teach it in any of our Bible schools, because we want Jesus to be a man who smiles all the time, always walks in slow motion, who has blue eyes and blonde hair. That's not my Jesus, and I want a Mediterranean Jesus, and I want a Jesus who overturns the tables in the temple. I want a Jesus who, in Matthew 23, confronts the Pharisees that are there and calling you hypocrites, you dental wipers, you white sepulchers, the entire chapel chapter is full of polemics. That's my Jesus. We've lost that Jesus. And I think we need to come back to India to find that Jesus again. That's why I'm spending so much time with you guys and gals, because you're the ones who I think are going to save Christianity. Um, where do I get the download for Haunting's material? You have to get it from his book. You don't download it. You, uh, you need to go to Gerald Haunting and look at Islam in the first century. Uh, that's there on Amazon. You can get it from him. Um, what about the untold story, Tom Holland? Thank you, SBS. You put it up there. You, for those on YouTube, you can hit that URL and you can go watch it tonight or tomorrow because it's getting late. Um, if you want to look at Dan Gibson, there can books. Thank you. Also, SBS, you put up the URL for that. What deduction can we make from the fact that the earliest map showing Mecca was not till 900 and the lack of historical evidence? What do the top Islamic scholars out there have to say on this problem? Can you state some reasonable responses given to you from Muslims on this objections raised and the counter? <laughs> have you got about another hour? I could go into it because Muslims do not come back. I have yet to see one Muslim. I have been asking this for 25 years. I did my first debate on this subject in 1995. We're 2020, and I have yet to see one Muslim that will even answer me. No Muslim will debate this. I can't get any Muslim to debate me on this because they saw what happened in 2014, what I did with Shabir Ali when I just asked basically 10 historical questions on the Quran. Wait till we get to the Quran. Wait till what you find out what we've now found on the Quran. You can see why Muslims don't know how to handle this material. They do not know how to handle it. They cannot answer it. Put yourself in their position. How would you, what would you do if you were told that there's no evidence for a person named Jesus Christ living in Jerusalem, uh, born in Bethlehem, dying in Jerusalem until the third century? We have no evidence for him at all until the third century that there is no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were actually living in the fourth century, that they were not at all from the first century. How would you defend Jesus? Where would you go? Because in order to defend Jesus, we would have to have documents, we'd have to have inscriptions, we'd have to have manuscript evidence, we'd have to have archaeological evidence, which we have all of, except for, we don't have manuscripts that early. But everything else we have, we have the right man at the right place. You cannot find anything for Muhammad at all 
until 691. You can't find any inscription. We can't find any tablets. We can't find any artifacts. We can't even find any reference to him until, except for those two references I gave you from outside of, his, of, of the Arab world. How would you defend that? How would you defend the Quran when you can't find one manuscript, one even partial manuscript from the seventh century at all? And the manuscripts that start to appear in the eighth century are not even complete nor agreeing with the Quran we have today. How would you defend that in public? So therefore, Muslims are not debating this. They're walking away from this debate. We and therefore have to debate it. And we've got to confront Muslims because this is what's going to destroy Islam more so than any other, because it's absolutely neutral. And it's what everybody's asking. They're not asking us about, people are not really saying, hey, tell me your story. I want to hear why you became a Christian. I want to know what God has done for you. That's all we want to talk about. What people are asking is three simple words. Is it true? And to answer those three simple words, you're going to have to prove that the person of Jesus Christ living at that time, at that place, doing those things, actually were correct. You've got to prove that on that, at that level. And so far, we're doing that. The difficulty is Islam has yet to do that. And that's why we really need to confront Islam on this. Come with me, guys and gals. We need to do that. If we already have mosques in India and China during the time of Muhammad, in such case, do we have any Islamic literature for that time in these two places that validate or disagrees with the message of the Quran or life of saints Muhammad? Absolutely, yes. Now, remember, these were not called mosques. These were temples. They then were taken over by the Muslims and called mosques, which means a masjid, which means a place to, to bow down. It's a place to pray. So masjids were then given the name. The mosque was given that name in the 8th and 9th century, much, much later. They were, not, they were nothing more than Nabataean temples, but they were all facing Petra. They continued to face Petra. They're still facing Petra even today. And that's what's interesting. 1,400 years later, they're still facing Petra. They're now mosques, but they're still facing Petra because they're historical sites. They can't throw them down. Is there anything written about that? We have nothing written about anything from those mosques that is anywhere near the seventh century. The only stuff that becomes to you is that gets started to appear is the Samarkand manuscript, which is from Uzbekistan in Tashkent. That one is from the mid eighth to late eighth century. It only goes up to Surah 43. It is full of manuscript errors, it has enormous manuscript. It is not the same Quran that we have today. And that's one of the earliest of the six earliest mosques. That's one of them. That's number three in the line of the six earliest, I'm sorry, not mosques, manuscripts of the Quran. Um, we have mosques in India and China during the time of Muhammad. And, okay, I've just read that one. How much, how, how important is it for the Muslims to really pray facing Mecca? As some say, niyat is important. For Muslims, you have to face Mecca because it's one of the five pillars. It's one of the five deans uh, that they taught, five practices. So facing the mosque, doing the five prayers, you have to pray towards Mecca because it's also in the Quran in chapter 2, verse 149. In chapter 2, verse 149, it says, from the, from the far mosque down to the the, um, um, the Masjid Al-Haram, which means the forbidden Masjid. Now, that doesn't say Mecca. You're right. It's not Mecca. As I said, you can only find Mecca once in the entire Quran. It's not in Surah 2, 149. It just says the Masjid Al-Haram, which means the Masjid, the place of bowing, the forbidden place of bowing, which Muslims today say is Mecca. But you have to put that in parentheses after the Masjid Al-Haram. You have to put Mecca in there. That is commentary. That is not in the Arabic. Um, let's gun them down. Even a one degree change in facing Mecca from India could probably take you to face to Riyadh. It just does not make sense to even believe. Well, that's the thing. And then why is it that's 22 degrees to 28 degrees to up as much as 60 degrees off from Mecca? If you can see, if people were going to those degrees, they would never get near Mecca. They're all facing towards Petra as far away as Canton, up until 706 at least. Here's a question. Mecca is famous for Zamzam water, right? Does it have to do with anything spiritual because it is inexhaustible? No, uh, it is not inexhaustible. I'm not going to get into the Zamzam well. The Zamzam well is supposedly where, uh, where Hagar was looking for water for Ishmael. And there's the story behind it, that when she was there in the desert, she needed water for her son. She ran to Marwa, the, the, which is interesting, the hill of Marwa. She couldn't find any water there. She went to the other hill. Marwa and Marwa and Safa, the other one is Safa, to find water. There was no water there. So she comes back to where her son was, and there was water bubbling up over the ground, and that became the Zamzam well, which is fascinating because it was, there is a Zamzam well also in Petra, which is interesting also because you have a Safa and Marwa, Marwa, and you have the two hills in Petra. They're still there today, and those are mountains. When you go to Mecca, Pastor Sheikh, did you ever go to Mecca? 
None of you went to Mecca? When you were a Muslim? Okay, if you go to Mecca today, now I've not been there, but there are pictures. You can look at the Safa and Marwa, where they run back and forth seven times between these two mountains. Look what they are today in Mecca. They're just two little rocks, 15-foot rocks that you can climb up on top of. Those are not mountains. So they're nothing more than facsimiles of the original Safa and Marwa, which are in Petra. Almost everything we see, in fact, every stage, the five stages of the Hajj that you see in Mecca, those five stages can all be found in Petra. And they also fit the dimensions that you see in the traditions. So you can see why the, 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 that we're now going back to Petra. We're gonna talk more about that in an upcoming talk, looking at those stages. I need to come to you through because it's now getting quite late for you all. It's now uh, coming up to 10 o'clock. Mecca is famous for Zamzam. Let's go. Why is there a threat of simply proving Mecca was science? Uh, why is the, the death threat for simply proving Mecca was simply off the historically known trade route? The, the death threat is because Muslims, the death threat is in chapter 4, verse 89 in the Quran. Those who leave Islam, if they leave, you must kill them. So it comes straight out of the Quran itself. Not, not every Muslim is going to kill you for saying these things. In fact, I have yet to get really death threats for talking about the historical critique. What are the death threats I get are almost always when I confront Muhammad, which we're going to do later on in another talk. But that's not for this kind of material. So don't worry about the death threats right now. Okay. Mark Anderson writes an article, Is Mecca or Petra Islam's birth, True Birth Faith? Where he critiques Dan Gibson's theory and concludes in his article, hence, contrary to what most revolutionists claim, we can affirm with reasonable confidence that Muslims do not mistakenly face the wrong direction when they pray. How do you respond to his critique of Dan Gibson? I would say very clearly, they don't do today, yes, but where, what, what is Mark Anderson referring to? Which date is he talking about? Since 822, all the mosques are facing Mecca. Is that what he's referring to? Or is he talking about the seventh century? And here's where da da uh, David King, who is the world authority on the Qibla, he wrote this paper here, the Petra Fallacy. This is a, how many pages long? This is 54 pages long, where he attacks Dan Gibson. This came out about a year and a half ago. And in every case, he had no response to Dan Gibson's new material. And the reason why, and I would say the same thing to Mark Anderson, you can talk about Petra, you can talk about Mecca today. No one's, no, one's, no one's suggesting they don't face Mecca today. What you cannot show me is any mosque facing Mecca prior to 727. Remember, 727 is 100 years after the Meccan Qibla was canonized in 624. 624 is when the Meccan Qibla was canonized. 727 is over 100 years later. So show me, Mark Anderson, where there's any Qibla that's facing Mecca, and then I'll believe you. But don't say that Muslims say that today. Of course they say that today. Every mosque is facing Mecca today, but not in the 7th century. Will this recording be shared? It's up to, I'm going to be sending it out to Pastor Shek. You'll have a, 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 a you'll have an example of this and also is Naranda Sahu here? Is he here? I don't see him. No, he's not here. I, yeah. I don't think he ever comes to these talks. This is the first, I've never seen him at one of these talks. Anyhow, I will send it to Naranda and also to Pastor Sheikh. So Naranda, you, uh, he, he can't hear this, but if someone could tell Naranda, he'll be responsible for sending it to his group. And Pastor Sheikh, can you make sure you send it to your group? So it'll be available. I'll send it through Hightail because it's going to be a huge file because this has all been recorded. Is there any proof of Jews killed at Banu Koreza? Muhammad killed the Jews. Any Jewish histories talk about it or any other sources to support that Muhammad existed? There were no Jews in Medina at all. We can't find any evidence of Jews living in Medina. We don't have any evidence for the Banu Kaneku, the Banu Nadir, or the Banu Koreza family. The Jews were all much further north. So all those stories are proving to be fraudulent. And this is going to step on the toes of many people who like to use those stories. Now, I'll tell you how you can use those stories, but not today. There's a whole way you can bring those stories into your discussion, but not today. So from a historical standpoint, we have to confront this notion that there were Jews in Medina or that Muhammad had a problem with Jews. I don't even know if Muhammad had any problem with Jews because I don't think Muhammad was even from Mecca or Medina. He was probably from Petra much further north. Praise God for you, sir. Highly appreciate your selfless service. In my experience, the Islamists are most times unwilling to debate. This has been my biggest challenge. I don't know how to deal with this issue. I think the best way to do that, what I usually do is when I'm in a conversation with a Muslim on any subject, they'll start making claims. Well, the Quran says this, or Muhammad says this, or the tradition says this. Just stop them and say, prove it. Prove it. Show me 
Show me in the Quran where there's a reference to Mecca. Show me in the Quran where there is a Qibla. Show me where the Qibla is. Prove it. You just, you can confront them every time they make a claim. Just say, can you show me? Show me in the tradition. Show me in the Quran. And then show, tell them, I don't trust those traditions because they're all too late. Why can't you tell me something from the 7th century? Show me from the 7th century. That's only 1,400 years ago. There's no reason why you can't have any reference to Muhammad 1,400 years old. You cannot tell me that this man could not have been known about since he was so important. He was the seal of all the prophets. Why didn't no one know about him in this century that he lived? And just ask them simply to show you. That brings it right into the conversation. And you can see that Muslims then have to do some backpedaling. And that's usually where disillusion starts to begin. You need to start this disillusionment. And then, then just end always with the gospel. Why is it we can tell you about Jesus Christ? Why is it we know where he was born, where he would die? We know where he rose again. We can pretty much support the resurrection. And we can even do it from using historical accounts. So this is the, the, this is the way you can do like with like on any of these issues. You said you have good success getting Muslims to come to faith. Was it in formal settings or personal approaching them or in the mosque? Actually, the most lately, it's all coming from my videos. We're getting many Muslims come to the Lord through the videos. So it's not personal. It's not, I don't even see them. I don't even hear from them. I hear about it afterwards. They usually get a hold of me or someone neutral puts me in touch with them. And that's how I find out that they've come to the Lord. But we're finding that almost every place I go now, in, on whenever I travel, I can't do it during the pandemic, of course, but when I travel, I have Muslims come up to me, they shake my hands, they come and see me, they give me hugs, and they recognize me because of my videos, because I, my face is all over the internet. And they usually either react one of two ways. They either want nothing to do with me, they have a lot of hatred towards me as a person, but they don't have hatred toward, I'm, I'm sorry, that's the other way around. They don't have hatred towards me, they have hatred towards what I'm saying. They have anger. At this material and I think the reason why is because they don't have a response for it for most of them it's the first time they've ever heard it the other reaction I get to they just want to hug and hug and hug me or they take my hand they want to stroke my hand or they cry on my neck and it's because they have given their life they've given up Islam because of this material and it's what I hear that I get the same recurring frame we have always been told that Muhammad was a man that God chose we have always been told that the Quran has always existed that it was eternal comes from these eternal tablets, that it has not been written by human hands. Those are the two things we've always been told. And without those two things, Islam does not stand. And here you are destroying those two things using completely neutral ter terminology and criteria. And you can see why it then cr crushes their whole faith, it because it takes out their foundations. It takes out the two foundations that they're totally dependent on. So you get these two kinds of different reactions. Now, you're not going to get that kind of reaction. I get it because of the fact that I go high profile with it. For those of you who are listening to this, you don't have to use this material right away. Please don't. Please don't jump all over the Quran and don't jump all over Mecca and don't jump all over Muhammad. Let us do that. Those of us who are trained to do that. All you need to do is ask one, two simple questions. Prove it. Whenever Muslims make a claim, just say, can you prove it? Prove to me that this man, Muhammad, lived in the 7th century. Prove to me that there was a Quran that existed in the 7th century. Prove to me that there was a city called Mecca that existed from the 7th century. Come back to me next week and show me those three things. Prove to me that there were people called Muslims living in the 7th century. Prove to me that there was a religion called Islam that existed in the 7th century. That's all you need to ask. And then just shuffle them off onto all of these videos that we're putting out on Fander Films so that you can all then use this material. Feel free to use it. I know that I've gone way or beyond. Let me see if there's any other questions. Um, is there any reference to the Qibla and Mecca? Then why speak? Of, if there is not reference to the Qibla and Mecca, then why speak of them? Because Muslims believe the Qibla. Because Muslims believe in Mecca. You've got to confront those two. It's not that we believe in Mecca or the Qibla. They do. And you've got to take them at where they're at. Start where they're at. When will you be using the minimal fact approach for the Quran and the Islam in your video? What do you, if, um, SBS, if you could explain what you mean by the minimal fact. What is that approach so I know what you're talking about? Are you there, SBS? Yeah, go ahead. I'll put you on. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, actually, the minimal fact method was an approach uh, taken by Gary Habermas uh, in proving the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, uh, he uses uh, two points over there, uh, two criteria, basically. 
the first is that uh, they must be facts that have a lot of evidence in their favor as that like you know establishing the historic truth i mean if you like for example the resurrection is the criteria when he uses it so here when it comes to uh, this method uh, there must be a lot of facts that have a lot of evidence on their favor and second is uh, these facts must be universally agreed or nearly universally agreed upon by scholars and historians who study the subject even the skeptical ones then once the facts are established as facts we then examine which explanation best ex explains them so uh, i'll just put this two criteria over here uh, on the chat so uh, i mean of course we have seen that uh, through history that it doesn't it doesn't it fails so if you can uh, use this approach to uh, uh, like just gary habermas if he's using this approach to critique the i mean to prove the resurrection we can use the same method to yeah. uh, you know try to debunk i would i believe uh, islam Brilliant. I like this. This is great what you're coming up with. Um, this is this is absolutely important. I think uh, SBS, when you look at SBS, when you look at the minimal fact, if, if I'm correct, if I'm hearing you correct, first of all, you need to have a, a, a number of facts that support your that support your your your, your reference or the support your, your conclusions. Secondly, it has to be accepted by the, even the skeptics is what you're saying. So not, it's not can't just be one it has to be both that even the, the skeptics accept your conclusions. If this were the case, then applying this to Mecca or Muhammad or seventh century Islam, just just call it seventh century Islam. What are the minimal facts uh, fact that we're asking for? We're asking for one, even just one reference from the man named Muhammad living in Mecca, receiving a Quran, calling himself a Muslim and being long to religion called Islam. That's all we're asking. One of those five criteria. The minimal fact is prove to us we're the skeptics. So therefore, we've got to be satisfied with what you've come up with. And that's exactly what we're doing now. This there another uh, corollary argument would be what we call um, what we call um, argument from silence. You've heard probably this one's SBS argument from silence, and this has been always the one that's foisted against me. i have always been for 25 years. Whenever I come up with all these problems with uh, the fact that none of these things existed, the comeback from Muslims has always been, "Well, you're only arguing from silence." An argument from silence doesn't. If argument from silence doesn't mean there's silence of argument. Doesn't mean that we haven't yet found it just because there's silence on it. Because we haven't yet found it, there, there doesn't mean that therefore we're not going to find it. So therefore, it's a very weak argument. That's how they've always come back on me. And I said, okay, but now we've come across the coins. See, the coins have kind of destroyed all of that because the coins are not silent. The coins are actually showing us crosses of, that belong to caliphs that are supposedly Muslims. And there's no reference on any of these coins to Muhammad, to the Quran, to Mecca, to Islam, or to uh, uh, people call Muslims. There is reference to Allah, but Asla is pre, Allah is pre-Islamic. Ilaha is an Abitian God. So that's well known. But there, suddenly now, by looking at the coins, we're going to do a whole talk on the coins. We have taken this argument from sign or minimal argument as you're talking about, and we've turned it on its head. Now, who are the ones who are arguing from silence? It's now the Muslims with their traditions that are now arguing from silence. They are the ones that have no minimal argument because everything they've said does not belong in the 7th century. It's all from the 9th century redacted back onto the 7th century. So all the claims they're making now are argument from silence. So we've shifted the whole, the whole argument from argument of science for us to prove Islam didn't exist to an argument from science for the Muslims to prove that Islam did exist. Can you see how this has all happened? And it's for us, it's just happened in the last six months. It's all happened since we found the coins. Well, the coins have always been there. It's just we never looked at them. And the numismatics, the numis, numismatists, how do you spell the, the numismatists, the people who are the experts on coins, they've always known about this. When we started coming up with this material, they all got in contact with me. I got contact with people from France, other people from the United States, other people from other areas of the world. They said, we know all about these coins, but we never knew the story behind it. We had no idea what you're coming up with. We had no idea to interpret what we were reading. We, couldn't, we understood the Arabic. We could even read it, but we didn't know what it was saying or the significance until you came up and you suddenly showed that this proves that there is no argument at all from the seventh century it is now an argument from science because we now have the material they don't so both of these arguments the minimal argument i love that they're bringing that up sps and the argument from science i love those two together kind of work work in our favor but this is the first time in what 40 years that i've been working in islam that we've had both of these in our favor let's run with them god bless you thank you for that sps that's very helpful the mfa method 
the minimal facts approach. Okay, it's called the MFA. It's an approach established in the truth of Jesus' resurrection. And you, the, you wrote this down. Thanks, S. Yeah, there's, there's two points. I just mentioned it over there uh, right. in the chat. Yeah. Listen, folks, grab these comments, take them because they're very good. They're very helpful. We can use these uh, comments for our own studies. Listen, I do realize it's after 10 o'clock. It's quarter after 10 for you all. It's very late. I do need to go. I have another two other big Zoom webinars coming up this afternoon and this evening, so I've got to prepare for them. But it's been great being with you guys and gals. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks, all right? In two weeks. And then we'll probably go into these coins. We'll go in to show you how devastating these coins are. I'll have it written up by then, so I'll be able to send you a PDF on the coins. God bless you. Thank you for all your time and effort. Thank you for being on board. Thank you, Shake, for all the new friends you brought on board with us. We'll see you in two weeks. Meanwhile, keep safe. Don't let the COVID get you. And keep, keep I still assume you're under lockdown, as are we. But I hope you enjoy this material. I hope you use it, and I hope you'll be able to find some Muslims that you can share it with. God bless you. This is Jay. Thank you, brother. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Bye-bye.